They are now. <laughs> All right. Uh, so it is 931. Uh, and I'll, I'll call us back to order um, and begin with uh, a land acknowledgement. So at this time, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory and Métis homelands and acknowledge the diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Soto, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit, and now settlers from around the world. Uh, so I will begin with a roll call. Uh, council members, Councillor Wright. Good morning. Morning, Councillor Knack. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Principe. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Paquette. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Tang. We'll check back with Councillor Tang. Uh, Councillor Hamilton. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Rutherford. Morning. Morning, Councillor Cartmel. Morning. Morning, Councillor Rice. Good morning. Good morning, and Councillor Jans. Good morning. Good morning, and uh, Councillor Tang, just checking back. Are you with us? No. Okay. Uh, so with that, uh, we will pick up where we left off, um, and that would be with item seven point four, the monthly update on the transit safety plan and downtown core. Uh, and I see we have a uh, delegation in front of us, so we'll hand it over for uh, some opening remarks. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and as we get our presentation up, I would just like to let you know that we are here today provi to provide a verbal update on the transit safety plan in the downtown core. I'm Jennifer Flamman, Deputy City Manager of Community Services. With me, I have EPS Superintendent Derek McIntyre, Robbie Caboni from Bentero, Dwayne Hunter, Director of Transit Safety, and Tom Gervin, Director of Downtown Vibrancy. As part of the delegation, we'll also be joined by other representatives um, who work with the vulnerable sector. As you know, this update is part of regular monthly updates to Council. We look forward to an open discussion of this complex work and also receiving feedback in terms of the content and formatting of these monthly verbal updates moving forward. As always, our aim is to provide the most current and relevant information possible so that you, as Governors, can make informed decisions. Next slide, please. We have for you here an outline of what we'll be discussing today. The intent of this presentation is to provide Council with a clear sense of current priorities and opportunities, as well as the challenges as we continue to work towards implementing the Enhanced Transit Safety Plan. We also know that creating experiences to bring people back to the downtown core is also an important part of this conversation. With that, I'll hand it off to Dwayne Hunter, our Director of Transit Safety. Good morning, everyone. First of all, we'd like to revisit questions from May 1st. Today, we are excited to share our transit safety measures and collaborative statistics. These highlight the entire transit system and recent proactive work. I also want to share an update on our unrelated but broader citywide work specific to measuring safety and well being. The Community Safety and Well Being team will be attending Council on July 4th, 2023, to provide a comprehensive update on strategy impl implementation. But for now, we want to note that a co Community Safety and Well Being Evaluation Framework is in development and will be ready by this fall. The evaluation framework will identify measures to evaluate CSWB outcomes and our progress, progress towards it. Phase one of a public CSWB dashboard will also be launched in early July to share baseline data about various safety and well-being trends in our city and work underway to make improvements. Both the evaluation framework and dashboard will focus on a broad number of issues, not solely transit safety. However, the work of the community and safety well-being will continue to feed into our work on transit safety and provide a strategic lens through which we track safety and well-being trends and measure our progress. Next slide, please. As a result of joint deployments with EPS and analysis of incident types and quantity, city administration and EPS continue to work together to determine the best deployment strategies that complement one another. The city aligns their definition of violent and nonviolent crime with the EPS, which is ultimately derived from Statistics Canada national standards. Examples of violent crime include homicide, attempted murder, sexual assault, assault, robbery, criminal harassment, uttering threats. In general, violent crime is when someone hurts or threatens to hurt someone, and also includes crime where a weapon is used. Next slide, please. The City of Edmonton and Edmonton Police Service, EPS, are using blended data, EPS and COE, to identify where and when to deploy resources. 
This will evolve into a robust understanding of who has the most appropriate knowledge, skills, and abilities and authorities to respond. Examples of teams. Healthy Streets Operations Center, HSOC, in downtown LRT stations. Coordinated deployment at Southgate and Century Park with EPS, Transit Peace Officers, TPOs, and community outreach teams. Southwest, Southeast, and EPS Northeast beat teams. Establishing a high, visit high visibility hub for COT. New transit community safety teams are EPS resources dedicated to the transit system. With the recent provincial announcement of additional police resources for transit, the EPS is building proactive teams to respond to transit in alignment with city initiatives. This model is currently in the development phase. Next slide, please. There have been a number of announcements by the federal and provincial governments leading up to the election period. To highlight a few, in February, the province initiated a 15-week pilot partnership between the Alberta Sheriffs and the EPS focused on the downtown core to enhance visibility of security in this space. There was also commitment to expand the use of the sheriffs to monitor offenders released on bail. We are waiting to hear from the province on that commitment. In April, the province announced a commitment to add 100 new police officers in Edmonton and Calgary, new packed and help teams, and $5 million for transit system cleanup. On May 16, 2023, the Government of Canada introduced Bill C-48 that proposes changes to the Criminal Code's bail provisions to promote community safety and reinforce public confidence in the administration of justice. This could have a significant impact on safety and transit spaces and the downtown core, as it would effectively make it harder for individuals with repeat offences to be released on bail. Next slide. While the city's encampment response is outside the scope of the transit safety plan, it is important work that comp that can complement positive changes within transit and downtown spaces. Implementation of the enhanced encampment plant is well underway. Primarily, the enhanced plan is a continuous improvement in testing exercise. It includes a number of actions, pilots and prototypes to see if changes and additions to the current encampment response will improve on the two key outcomes, namely, people experiencing unsheltered homelessness have clear, consistent and rapid connections to supports and housing. And encampments do not diminish individual and or public safety. A steering committee and four working groups have been established to implement this work, made up of representatives from administration, EPS and social agency partners. This work will also include advisors that live with lived experience and from Indigenous partner organizations. There are a total of 15 actions and five prototypes being undertaken this year. One of the most critical issues in this spring's encampment response plan was a very real threat to the city's parkland with dry conditions and encampment related fires. The encampment response team was, has been working to mitigate those issues, but during fire ban periods, we have been encouraging people to report observed fires in parkland immediately before they have the chance to get out of control. We're hoping that this year's prototype on mitigating fire risk help curbs the risk that we see every year in encampments. With that, I'll hand it over to Tom Gervin, our Director of Downtown Vibrancy. Thanks, Dwayne. I'm Tom Gervin, Director of Downtown Vibrancy. Uh, Downtown Vibrancy's contribution to safety focuses on improving the perception of safety by attracting more people downtown to live, work, play, and visit, which in turn improve safety. These actions include providing funding for projects led by businesses and organizations that attract more people downtown, like the many festivals and events that we host, as well as safety-focused activities such as the overdose prevention and response teams by Boyle Street Society and the Nighttime Patrol by Edmonton Downtown Business Association. It also includes city-led projects that help create a safe and welcoming environment, such as the Meet Me Downtown marketing campaign and Civic Centre Light Up, which increases visitation, and the Clean City Initiative, which focuses on cleanliness, beautification, and infrastructure maintenance. Collectively, these actions... The Community Outreach Transit Team is an important and innovative step in broadening our reach, both by responding to the needs of our community and by building a safe and inclusive city for everyone. The goal was to build relationships with the most vulnerable Edmontonians who often seek shelter in the transit network. Rather than simply shift the issue by removing people from the network, the goal was to bring more appropriate social support into the transit network and begin the navigation work with those who need it where they are. 
In the first 18 months of operating, COT has had more than 6,000 interactions in transit stations and more than 1,000 in-depth engagements. These more focused interactions typically lead to referrals, transportation, or warm handoffs. Additionally, COT has provided 45 instances of medical aid, such as first aid or drug poisoning reversal, and there have been over 400 instances of COT providing supplies, such as clothing, food, and water. COT also tracks qualitative stories of individuals they have helped achieve goals ranging from connecting to addiction supports to obtaining various forms of housing. Most recently, the team began hosting bi-weekly connection booths. During the last week of May, our COT team joined by Alberta Health Services Opioid Dependency and Enhanced Addictions Clinic teamed up for three public engagement events. The team offered available services for mental health, addiction supports, and social services for those in need on our transit system. Our Transit Community Action Team, or TCAT, also worked in partnership with these proactive efforts to guide over 75 folks from our vulnerable community to connect with the COT booth. These stories help illustrate not just the impact COT has had on these individuals, but the long-term relationship building and increase in trust that takes place between COT and its clients. Next slide, please. We have a number of summer 2023 shelter and housing-related updates for you as well. Hope Mission is currently still receiving funding for an additional 150 24-7 temporary shelter spaces from the Government of Alberta. It is unclear how long this funding will continue, and this includes an extension to continue the service hub pilot Hope Mission has been operating. The 150 24-7 congregate shelter spaces at the Jasper Place Wellness Centre West End Shelter closed on May 31st, and the 100 day shelter spaces at the Jasper Place Wellness Centre Community Resource Centre closed on May 29th. Currently, day services are being provided in the West End through the Mustard Seed at their Christian Care Centre. They operate five days per week from 9 a.m. to noon for drop-in services and a breakfast meal. Next slide, please. Thank you. Edmontonians are beginning to notice the results of the integrated and sustained efforts to support transit safety and security. We've heard from Council that consistent and integrated communications are key to this work and we are absolutely on it. Thank you to Council for the work you're doing to showcase the program efforts. You may have noticed a full court press on the communications related to the reopening of the stadium station. Through an in-person news conference, media were able to experience the updated facility design. We also showcased the improvements to the ridership for both the recent Luke Combs concert and with the new season for the Edmonton Elks. We look forward to continued collaboration with the Elks and other event and festival partners to recover our occasional riders and reach new folks who are looking for a safe, economical, and environmentally friendly way to travel to all that Edmonton has to offer. Throughout the summer and into the fall, anticipating back-to-school ridership, look for more positive announcements, proactive communications, and social media posts. Our communications will include our tripartite partners, EPS and Bentero, but also Edmontonians, businesses, and organizations with a relationship to the transit system. We will continue to look for creative ways to tell our story and where there is an opportunity for Council to be involved, especially at the ward level, we will be reaching out. Next slide, please. While we are taking steps to address an increase in violent and non-violent offences, we recognize that the majority of community members turning to transit facilities are seeking safety and support. To address safety and security while providing culturally appropriate support, we've expanded on the previous plans and logic models to create a more fulsome theory of change. This enhanced plan fully captures the scope of changes and improvements we as a city are working towards. In addition to a common goal that all tripartite members and strategic partners can work towards, we've identified four pillars of focus to guide our work, short, medium and long-term outcomes within each of the four pillars to work towards, key activities which identify what actions need to be taken to achieve the outcomes we've identified, and measures which will inform us of our progress. Next slide, please. To achieve these outcomes, the joint teams will be undertaking targeted activities to improve the measure we've identified. We will continue to refine and expand on these measures as we learn from the impact of our multifaceted approach. As we include additional data streams, we will begin to understand the correlation between the pillars and how activities in one can impact another. For example, how does providing support and services for some community members impact a rider's perception of safety? By moving the needle in the right direction for the measures, 
under each pillar, we expect to move closer to our main goal. The transit spaces are safe and support the well-being of all Edmontonians. Next slide, please. Statistics from EPS, ETS, and Bentero have been gathered to provide a current state overview of the entire transit system. EPS data indicates that violent offenses are trending upwards, and typically these are offenses that are higher in severity and lower in frequency. The crime severity index measure for transit is still in the development phase. To measure a community member's perception of safety, we first reference EPS statistics for nonviolent criminal offenses, which decreased in comparison to May of 2022. This measure includes the offenses that many would refer to as social disorder, i.e. drug incidents and mischief. Vandalism and graffiti have an impact on how a person feels in a space, and in an effort to measure this information, we'll be providing the budget amount spent to repair the damages. These numbers are still in development to ensure employee reporting aligns with the current dates. Transit peace officers are dispatched to a large number of calls across the system every year. These type of calls align with the non-violent criminal offenses defined by the EPS. These numbers are also trending upwards. To enhance our understanding of perception of safety, three surveys will be conducted. Our traditional system-wide research study, along with our new point in time and location specific survey, QR code, as well as an ethnograph ethnographic study. Our well-being measures are provided by Bentero. Interactions are an in initial conversations focused on building rapport, understanding of the program, and discussions around available support and services. Engagements are the next step in the process and focus on bridging services. Measuring the impact of working together, integration, will provide us with the understanding of how to best achieve the outcomes in the other pillars. Next slide, please. All of the outcomes contribute to the overall goal, that transit spaces are safe and support the well-being of all Edmontonians. All of the people working to increase transit safety can, can identify with one or more of the pillars highlighting their importance and contributions. Safety. All people are physically safe in transit spaces. Perception of safety. Edmontonians perceive transit to be safe and are not deterred to use transit for safety reasons. Well-being. Edmontonians are connected to culturally appropriate supports, reducing the use of transit spaces for non-travel purposes. Integration. Transit safety is strengthened through collaboration between City of Edmonton, Edmonton Police Service, and Bentero. Next slide, please. In response to a significant number of incidents in or around the Southgate Transit Facility, our tripartite group led a proactive initiative. The Southgate approach was a unique project because it included mall administration and security teams, along with city representatives of the Malmo community. Everyone was working towards a common goal and communicating the same message to the public. Seven days a week, from 7 a.m. until 5 p.m., an EPS patrol constable would pair with a TPO at Southgate and Century Park stations. Their work vehicles would be parked at the facilities and the two would proactively patrol each location and rotate between stations every couple of hours using the LRT. COT teams also complemented the proactive efforts at Southgate. Patrols were also expanded to include the mall and areas around the west portion of the transit facility boarding the Malmo community. Next slide, please. The project ran for two months, beginning on March 9th. The number of violent offenses remained the same when compared to May of last year, but there was a decrease of eight non-violent criminal incidents that were reported to EPS. A continual decrease in calls for service for TPOs began in March of 2023 at 100 and ended in May 2023 with 69. Evidence that a joint deployment model involving EPS and the TPOs has a significant impact on non-violent calls for service. COD interactions were slightly down as there were fewer referrals over this time and staffing constraints. We did learn that having COT work from one specific location was a very beneficial event. Statistics on their own provide understanding. When coupled with feedback, they capture much more. Below are two excerpts from letters sent in from the community. My name is Rani Sidhu. I am the owner of the coffee and snack shop located inside the Southgate LRT Transit Centre. I'm writing you 
because I want to voice my immense gratitude to the police officers that are stationed at the transit center. It has been a long time since I felt safe. Every day I worried about seeing my family at the end of the night, my customer's safety, as well as the day-to-day -day transit riders. Today, I realized I could take a deep breath and concentrate on trying to bring my business back to how it used to be. From Jazz, Southgate Security. Hope you're both doing well. I'd like to greatly appreciate the Edmonton Police Officers, EPS, and Transit Peace Officer, TPO, for providing an excellent service at the Southgate Station, as well as in the near neighborhood. Since the ETS Station SOP started, we have noticed an overall positive impact in the community. Please extend our gratitude to the EPS and TPO officers for their dedication and for keeping us all safe. The results and feedback validate the Southgate approach. But most of all, we saw the value of collaboration, which helped us approach incidents with the appropriate knowledge, skills, and abilities. There are service, security, and safety requirements throughout the transit system. And having the appropriate group, security guards, TPOs, EPS, and COT attend is vital to success. Next slide, please. There are many proactive initiatives currently underway, as mentioned throughout this presentation, including, but not limited to, 5 million grant from the province focused on cleaning up our transit facilities and making facility improvements. QR code survey. Public will have the ability to provide feed, real-time feedback at several stations. Outreach hubs. Animating transit spaces and places. 50 police officers to transit to sport a hybrid model. Festivals and events. Ongoing integrated communication with Edmontonians. This work continues to evolve and we look forward to taking any questions you may have. Excellent. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for, for that presentation. Um, I'm sure we'll have questions, so I'll just wait for the board to populate. Just give us two seconds and we'll just set it up. Sure. Uh, and I believe this was selected by, looking around, was it Councillor Knack? I've got Councillor Knack, yeah. Yes. Councillor Knack, would you like to start? Sure. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Um, and and uh, thanks for this information. Again, uh, really enjoying having these updates. I think it's, it's critically important to helping make sure people know where we're at. Um, and with that, I, I did just want to ask a little bit more on, on the communications piece um, because some great stories you've shared today, I think some moving in the right direction for me, and maybe it's just me, and uh, happy to hear what my colleagues have to say on it as well, I, I'm, I'm feeling like we're still not really doing a lot of communication. Um, I, I, I've heard that there was, a, you know, I read the slide, but I'm, I'm looking at things like some of these good news stories and, and I'm not seeing where they're being shared so that I can easily share them out. You know, I heard the story about the opening of the, common, uh, the Commonwealth piece, that's great, but where are the stories about all of these resources that are being dedicated? Where's the two minute City of Edmonton video or EPS video of those, those testimonials that we got that, that are more easily shared because I'm still getting tons of emails and tons of calls from people who who feel like they aren't seeing anything's being done. And I think those are folks who maybe aren't using the system. And so there's a bit of this perception of if I'm never using the system and I'm still reading Nextdoor app and I'm still reading Facebook posts that say, here's a bad thing that's happening and I'm not experiencing it for myself, what, what are we doing to try to help make sure those folks know there's more communication or there's more action being taken? Thank you for the question, Councillor Knack. We have put together a long-term strategy that will be coming forward, but in addition to that, we've actually dedicated uh, one resource that has joined our transit safety team to help with that. Okay. We, we do need to do better there, and we're getting there, and we're figuring out how to do that. Okay. So we're just at the in the infancy of that. And again, I know my suggestion last time was just a suggestion, but I, I, I'm gonna say it again. I mean, it, to, to this day, I still don't, you know, and I, if I've missed it, somebody can tell me, but to this moment, I still don't think we've seen anything on EPS's Facebook page shared over the last, since the last monthly update around, hey, here's who, how we've redeployed, or the City of Edmonton's Facebook page, or, you know, we have City of Edmonton, I think, official folks on the Nextdoor app, and, and who can help get a message out there that can then be amplified by council, 
And, and that's the, those are the type of things I'm interested in. And if, if those you don't feel are valuable, then please tell me, I won't ask for them. But, but I, I, I feel like that's what's needed right now, the help. Thank you for that. And I'll maybe uh, refer to Ryan Barkley to talk maybe a bit more about our social sure. media strategy. Absolutely. Sure, thank you. Uh, absolutely, we're continually looking for ways to be more assertive with how we're sharing those sort of things. Uh, from the Transforming Edmonton blog through to Instagram and LinkedIn, but we're continually building and trying to be as cohesive as possible with how we're getting those stories out, especially in those sort of means, like those two-minute videos that you're, sh you're thinking about. Yeah, and, and I mean, I should say, I've noticed a significant change from the City of Edmonton's communication in the last two months. I, I think that the job that you're doing and the team, the team that you're working with is doing phenomenal work. It's just on this particular file, it's like the one that I feel like it's the most critical and yet it's the one I don't see the incredible work that you're doing. A and again, I, I think there's a role in EPS because they've got a large reach in their th uh, on their social media and, and I'm not sure how we can, you know, we can't, we can't require EPS to, to share, but gosh, it, it's, it's, it's feeling <laughs> frustrating when it's like there's so many people talking about it and nobody seems to be sharing. So how do you work with EPS's communication on that? We're continually looking at ways that we can reach out and align messaging and share products across platform. Okay, okay. Um, so yeah, that's something I'll, I'll, I'll be interested in really seeing if there's a, a tangible difference next month and, and if there's actual posts and things that can be shared. I mean, overall, again, I think it's because the work that you're doing is incredible. I just, I want to be able to tell that story better and, I'm, and I feel like I'm struggling to be able to tell that story. Um, the only other question I think I, I have in this short amount of time, with regards to transit cleanup, uh, lots of great work. I'm hearing great things, seeing great things, particularly in the core. Um, I am still getting a lot of questions around uh, transit cleanup in, in other uh, centers, transit centers outside the core. So I think about in, in the ward I represent, Jasper Place, although not within the ward I represent, West Edmonton Mall is, is well used by many represented, uh, ward representatives, um, or ward residents rather. What's the work plan for cleanup in those areas in terms of, of keeping it safe and clean and, and up to date? Uh, thanks, I can take that back to the team, that feedback. We do have ongoing cleaning across all 42 different transit centers, um, but if there are specific areas of concern and we think maybe we're not hitting the right level, uh, can certainly take that back to our cleaning team. Okay, perfect, I'm out of time for round one, thank you. Great, thank you, Councillor Knack. Uh, Councillor Jans, go ahead. Thank you, and just a heads up, I'll probably need a few rounds. I've got five different themes here. Um, first of all, really appreciate this. This is great, we should do it every month. Um, we do, right? Yeah. Uh, so first of all, um, I, uh, I just wanna say thank you, and I just wanna look at, so celebrating some success. So first of all, if I recall, we're the first jurisdiction to reach pre-COVID pre ridership numbers, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, and, and when we talk about transit safety, really what we're talking about is Per, like the LRT, right? Like 90% of our incidences or, or the vast majority are on trend, on the LRT, not the bus system. Am, am I also correct there? We have more incidents. I don't know the exact number on LRT, but also in our pedways that adjoin to the transit facilities. So we have kind of all three spaces. There are, there's less frequency in buses for sure. Okay, do we know by, like, do we have a number on that? Like based on calls like 80, 20, 70, 30? I don't, uh, because I think one key message I would want to get out of this is that overwhelmingly the vast majority of our buses are safe. I rarely see any social disorder, um, rarely see littering aside from a straight coffee cup there. I'm, I mean, I'm not naive. There have been some really terrible incidences that have happened on the bus, but the, the vast majority of the problem that we're trying to solve is, is the LRT. Am I, am, is my thesis kind of correct there? It's a fair assumption for sure. Yeah, because uh, I'd want Edmontonians to know that. So also when I'm looking at the raw data here, like um, seeing an increase of, of you know, one is, one is too many on any of these, but when I see an increase on some of these, how do we index these against ridership? Like say, I saw an open alcohol, but it was on like the Oilers playoffs and the, then the stations were packed. And so like, how do, how do we adjust for, we're seeing more incidences, but we're also seeing, uh, a much higher denominator too. That is something we're continuing to work together as we put together these stats to add that other layer. We did not have it ready for this report. Um, there's also another factor and that's the number of incidents that happen in the Pedway system and we're doing a lot of work to learn how to capture those. 
we don't have those numbers in the Pedway systems yet, and uh, but we are working on that. So uh, specifically, like the once you go down the stairs, like in most cases in uh, around downtown, is that what you mean? That would be the platform that is is commonly referred to as the platform. I'm I'm speaking about the areas leading up to the platform. So if we think about Churchill, before you go down the escalators down to the platform to take the train, it would be all the areas adjoining that. So We're sort of walking from the west end to City Hall and through Absolutely, there. Absolutely, sir. Okay, okay. Um, so we need a way to look at that as well, too, because because I just, from the data, I want to make sure we're triaging our, our response appropriately there. Um, so yeah, I'd love more data and to understand that better because that helps us advocate. Um, the costing piece, so how much I saw we're spending, we received five million in April from the transit system cleanup. Do we have a, like, could we get a slide maybe for next month or just what is the total spend? Like commissioners, TPOs, Edmonton police, the sheriffs, um, Bantero, other other investments? Are there other so numbers? That five million that was re referenced in the presentation, that is re with respect to facility improvements and cleaning. And there, the GOA gave us several different definitions that we can use that for. Uh, for next time, we will have a list breaking down where we are spending the money. Uh, right now, there are restrictions within this funding that's, uh, uh, that we have to make sure we work with the GOA prior to e releasing the information. So On that five million, right? Exactly. But on the meta spent, like I think, would it be fair to say that since 2017 to 2023 or 2018, five years, over the last five years, we've seen a number of different investments in a number of different areas here from all parts of the community, all orders of government, the police and others? We'll provide an update, sir. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, then uh, I wanted to better understand, so who are the, we have the, com the commissioners, um, the TPOs, Edmonton Police, and who are the, I'll call them Paris supports, or I don't know if we, what do we call them, partners or others who are dedicated to supporting the LRT system? That's Bantero, who, who else? There is our opioid response team, and that's ran through Bissell Street. And there's also many other social um, partners who attend um, with, on their own, and they work in the transit spaces as well. So some of the other people in those spaces, we don't know exactly who is where at those times, but we do have other people working in those spaces. Okay, I'm out of time. I'll do another round. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Jones. Um, Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for this presentation. Really appreciate it. Um, I can see that uh, it was needed because we are still gathering uh, information and data that will be important to report. So on that note, um, I'm wondering if we are going to be getting a breakdown of the types of violent crimes um, that were listed and the other crimes as well. So that it's not just a, a, a lump number, but we can actually parse out and say like, oh, okay, so these are the types of crimes that are occurring in these numbers. Absolutely, we can provide that definition for you. Okay, that would be very helpful. Um, because I, I think one of the things that we really have to do here is dispel uh, some myths and also provide clarity to people about what is actually happening. And therefore, as a result, we will have this metric in the dashboard that people can follow along and see if things are improving or not um, in those specific categories. So along with that, this one might be a, a bridge too far, but will we be collecting data or tracking um, anonymized information on, uh, on folks who are being uh, arrested or going into the justice system so we can see what that uh, looks like where, like, do the charges stay? Do they get back out uh, of the system? That sort of thing, so that we can actually reliably and accurately uh, portray that information. Because right now, it kind of feels like we've got a lot of anecdotes, but not a lot of data on that. To your first question, uh, to finish off on the types of crimes, would you also want time frames on that? Councillor Paquette, because we yeah, can- Of course. Okay, so we'll include those. And then to your second question about tracking someone through the justice system, uh, we're beginning to work on a project that will actually 
do just that. We've made good partners with uh, the Department of Justice, the Provincial Crown, and our Municipal Crowns to uh, to work to identify those coming, uh, those causing the most harm in the transit facilities, and then actually following them through the justice system and uh, seeing what happens as a result from doing the enforcement. So we're just building that now. It's, uh, it's, it's really exciting because it could really have a positive impact. And then as a result of that, when we work with those causing the most harm, we have more opportunity to provide support and services to the other Edmontonians in those spaces. Okay, great. And uh, will we also be getting a breakdown of transit stations um, and the resources deployed to each based on the metrics of, of what we see occurring there and then measure the results of that deployment? That's where we want to get to. And that's going okay. to take some time. We really yep. want to get to the point where we're able to look at the data the data will tell us at this location, a security guard is sufficient. At this location, we actually need police and a TPO, or do we just need police? So where we're going to go and the path we're walking down with EPS is, if we have more violent crime that fills that safety pillar of work, that's obviously a, safe, uh, a police response. When we have right. more of a security, we, we, can, we can do that. So that's our end goal, sir. We're just beginning down that path. Okay, uh, we call my father, sir. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so that's excellent. Uh, so we can deploy the right resources in the right way, the right places in the right times, which is the ultimate goal. Okay, and uh, this one's a little bit, maybe a bit uh, too far out there, but uh, um, since we're already doing the cot work and the uh, health work, um, are we also gathering anonymized data uh, to determine motive or root causes of behaviors and then tracking that. So, you know, this is addiction, this is mental health, this is gang activity. Here are the factors leading to those things and here are the supports those people actually receive. Um, are we actually going to be tracking that as well? So we get a larger understanding of why these things are occurring and therefore we can address them a little bit more effectively. We are doing that informally right now, but we are working with Bent Arrow with respect to a software, a client management software that would align with um, what help teams are using with EPS and uh, to help us track that person. And what I mean by track, I don't mean uh, paying attention to their location, I mean get them to the right services and the right service providers they currently have so we don't restart every single time we, we meet that person. So we are working towards that with Ben Terrell. Excellent. Thank you. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Wright. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, Mr. Barkway, I'm just wondering what sort of, um, what sort of surveys, whether they're in-site or, you know, um, sort of in-person type surveys um, for the, a broader um, perception of safety within the city or, or maybe a, a perception of safety by by all Edmontonians, maybe not just the ones that ride in transit? We will be starting that work in the coming months to look at what safety uh, perceptions Edmontonians have. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, and then, Ms. Lemon, you mentioned about how COD offers available mental health services. And I'm wondering, is there a limitation on what, on that availability of health services? Whether it's addiction supports or mental supports, they are constrained by what AHS and our health um, ecosystem can provide. So they, they do as much as they can to provide those warm handoffs, but there's cer there certainly uh, greater demand than there is supply. Okay, and, and then because I'm just noticing on slide 17, um, and I'm sorry, I didn't get the name of the representative from Bent Arrow. It's Ms. Robbie Caboni. Caboni, Ms. Caboni. Um, so with the... Um, the, the Southgate LRT station, um, the number of outreach engagements has, has dropped like in half. So is that a result of um, not needing the services or lack of um, people to assist? I can jump in and oh, assist with okay. that one. Uh, as I as the one of the project leads. With that particular instance, we were training 
several new outreach workers and transit peace officers at that time, so it limited our capacity and ability. But we also saw that um, they were there, and being in one place, you'd, you'd more likely to get... Actually, you know what, we, act, we, we didn't know why it dropped completely. We believe that maybe um, it was continual people in there. We, we don't know. We're still looking into understanding why it dropped. I believe it's probably just a capacity issue. Okay, so that, it, it was know. due to lack of resources? That's or? what we think. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I'm just wondering, Mr. Hunter, you also talked about the, the 15 innovative prototypes, and I'm just wondering, how do they differ from COT, TRAC, TCAT, HELP, PAC, HSOC? What, what's new and different about those? Those prototypes are in response to the enhanced encampment response. Okay, yeah, okay. So that is totally separate then from Correct. all the other transit. Okay. Um, and, oh, talking again about resources, um, th there was mention of the 100 new officers, and I'm just wondering what about recruitment efforts. I had, I had heard, I think, in one reporting that um, recruitment for, for EPS officers was facing challenges. Good morning, it's <clears throat> Superintendent Derek McIntyre with the EPS. Uh, recruiting in the profession of policing um, continentally is, is facing challenges, but it's not really a challenge that we're not willing to accept in the EPS. Uh, we've recently just completed a strategic plan in relation to what our recruiting selection and training plan is going to look like in order to ensure that we're able to meet this, this commitment from from the GOA and from the police service in relation to putting 50 new police officers on transit. Okay, so I guess, how many vacancies are there right now that you're looking to fill? I, I know I think we've got a, a, a gradu graduating class coming later this week. Mm -hmm. um, so after that, how many, how many spots are left to fill? 50, we haven't formalized, <clears throat> with the selection of cabinet on Friday, we haven't formalized uh, with the GOA exactly what the the requirements that they have for the funding, what it looks like in relation to where we're going to deploy them. We're really involved with the enhanced transit strategy at this point as an integrated partner. Uh, we have committed two teams of existing proactive crime management resources to transit May 1st, uh, but those will be reclaimed back into the function that they're in as we build out our 50 member plan over the next 18 months. Okay, those 50 are just for transit? The 50 for, yeah, funded by the GOA are just for transit. Okay, so, but overall, EPS's sort of vacancy rate of, of the officers that are needed? For the whole police service? Yeah. I don't have, that's would be our, our human resources division would carry that number. I don't know what it is. Okay, because I was just wondering if that would be an indication of, um, of being able to hire those extra 50 if we can't hire, you know, another 20 or 30 for the, for the overall police force. Okay. Um, and I guess my time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Stevenson. Uh, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate the conversation this morning. Maybe I, I will switch tracks momentarily just to, to touch on downtown um, and the vibrancy work that's happening there. Um, just wondering if, if you're planning to look at some of those, those measures as well in terms of, um, I'm thinking parking utilization, new businesses opening, event attendance, um, even 311 calls with cleanliness concerns, just looking if, if you're also developing some of those measures. Yeah, we're focused on tracking the progress of the Clean City Initiative first and foremost, um, and have uh, the appropriate data collection in place to support uh, evaluation of that project as it moves forward. Also working with an external partner to track the, um, the number of people downtown um, and specific to locations. So that work is uh, near its implementation stage and I'm hopeful that I'll have an update uh, in the coming months about um, the number of people downtown as it relates uh, you know, year over year but also pre-pandemic. So that's really the focus in terms of the vibrancy work and uh, the data, the parking util utilization will be one aspect as we'll be tracking um, all of the funding uh, through reports from the, uh, the grant recipients. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that we have uh, more festivals and events planned for downtown than we did pre-pandemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So well. the, the return there is, is beyond healthy and uh, the diversity uh, of those events continues to grow as we see more events hosted in particular by businesses mm -hmm. um, with a brick and mortar presence, so. Yeah, yeah, no, it's fantastic. I mean, I think, I think 
qualitatively, you know, I, I feel such a difference in the downtown. I think even just thinking of, you know, June used to be kind of quiet before the, the big festival started, but every week, I, every day, I'm, what's happening in Churchill today? Like, there's always something. So that's, that's really exciting, and I think having some of that data to, um, to follow that up. I think, you know, maybe I'll just share as well, and maybe you can confirm that, you know, I'm hearing a lot of, of positive feedback in terms of the cleanliness levels from, from stakeholders in the downtown who are really noticing that difference. I can confirm that. Excellent. Yeah, we've made a lot, lot of progress. It's been great work by our, our teams in uh, city operations, and that feedback is constant. Yeah. So yeah. Well, I can I tell you, sorry, Councillor, from a data perspective too, the, um, the projects I mentioned, the overdose prevention response team with Boyle Street, mm -hmm and the night patrol by the Downtown Business Association. Really strong data collection on both, so um, those are inputs that we, we use to help evaluate the success of that, uh, of both of those programs. Great, great, yeah, thank you so much, and thanks, thanks for the ongoing work. Um, I guess I, I'm just kind of geeking out this morning around measures, um, uh, but really, really excited, switching back to transit now. Um, first of all, I just want to acknowledge that justice tra system tracking sounds so, so phenomenal, really, really interesting in terms of kind of mapping out, you know, the interventions we can, we can make, but then what are, what's, what's the outcome of those, those interventions. So really excited that that's underway. Um, and I think as Councillor Paquette mentioned, sort of those pathways in, in can also be an interesting mapping so that we understand, you know, can we intervene at an earlier stage to avoid some of that. Um, and great to hear the success of the Southgate model as well. Just maybe building on some of the measures that you're looking to collect. Um, so are we looking at like the number of times like the blue the blue phones are used, sort of those emergency calls, which I, I think go to like the TPO command center? Yes, they do. They go to our transit security dispatch and, and they are tracked. Okay. We're not utilizing them this time and interpreting them, but it's something we can look at for sure. Yeah, I think I think that, that that could be a helpful number just in terms of the number of times that people are in transit spaces and they feel the need to use that. You know, I think we would we would want to be seeing a decrease in that over time and it could just be be one of those measures that we add in there. Um, you know, I think Councillor Jans touched on it briefly, but just looking at um, maybe maybe to our colleagues in ETS, um, wondering if we can just have have this monthly reporting on ridership because I think that that those numbers um, also speak to the perception of transit in terms of how many people are are making use of the system? Yeah, we can absolutely do that. We're overall across all modes at least about 20 to 25 percent up wow. compared to this time last year. Wow. Uh, this past week's boardings just on the bus side alone, uh, we were at 106 percent of normal levels. Um, mm. So happy to do that. We can we can share those figures with you. Great. Well, I think I think having those just on their own is very helpful and then I think, again, maybe looking at that incidence per rider would also be helpful because I think we could get stuck where we maybe continue to see, despite excellent efforts, great great integrated work, we potentially see increases in incidence, but, but they may not be proportional to the increases in the growth of, of ridership as well. So uh, maybe just having that as a context piece. But I'm out of time. Thank you again all so much for your, for your great work. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Um, Councillor Tang, could you take the chair, please? So taken. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll pick up right there and just, just echo uh, the desire to see some of that um, broader context and, and being able to situate uh, the data that's in front of us today uh, within the context of ridership, I think will be super, super helpful. So uh, very pleased to see and, and to hear that that can be part of future updates. Um, so I'll just jump into a few a few questions. Uh, and I'll start with COT. So, um, the full the, the seven teams are are we fully fully up and running with the seven teams uh, at this point? Yes, yes. I can. Uh, I'll jump in on that. Uh, we are uh, at the seven teams now. They're still doing a little bit of sort of on the ground training, but uh, all seven are in place now. Excellent, excellent. That's really exciting to hear. Um, and then I was also interested in the COT booth, um, and I understand that's only been up and running since uh, I think end of end of May. Um, what have we been hearing uh, feedback on the? Sort of more, uh, I guess, location-based caught um, implementation. I think we're uh, we're testing different models on that. I mean, I, I know that they go out uh, and respond when the other TPOs call them into the into different scenarios. But having them in one place and um, partnering them with TCAT, where the TCAT teams are sort of directing people to go to the booth. Uh, seems like it, it was able to uh, 
reach out to more people in the in about the same amount of time and so we're, we're continuing to explore what that might look like with respect to different locations times etc okay fantastic um, and then just on uh, some of the questions that were being asked around the 50 uh, 50 officers um, I understand Obviously, there's there's some challenges right now uh, with bringing folks on board. Do we have any line of sight to timing for when we could expect to see uh, those 50 officers brought on? Or are we talking in just in generalities? Are we talking weeks, months, a year? We uh, created a, a transit safety initiative within our crime suppression branch uh, starting May 1st. So we have two teams dedicated to transit full time now. So that's 16 members, two sergeant and two sergeants and 14 constables are currently dedicated to transit now, and that is specifically to your comment earlier, councillor, on the LRT. We are looking at, and we're working with our working with the GOA, and we're working with our commission, obviously, on what a plan. We don't have an approved plan. We're developing a plan, but to say that the timeline <coughs> that we are looking at what it's going to take to recruit, select, train and actually deploy 50 new police officers into you know into this function is we're looking at an 18 month timeline is what we're looking at okay okay um that's that's helpful uh and i guess as those 50 additional officers are brought on um the two teams that you just described would those be redeployed elsewhere what's the what's the intention there is the intention is to reclaim them back into the function that they originally, which is citywide crime management. And what we've done right now is we've prioritized this function on transit, pivoted those two teams away from citywide crime management, which comes at a cost that we're going to have citywide crime management less resources for that. But this is a priority for the, for the city and for the police service. So as we build that model out, the intention would be to reclaim those mm -hmm. police officers, those mm -hmm. 16, into their original function. Okay, okay, that's helpful because I, um, you know, when, when I get those types of questions from constituents saying, hey, like, this is clearly a priority, um, are resources being redirected and allocated towards it? Uh, I always answer absolutely yes. Um, so, so to know that uh, EPS has identified that this is a priority, absolutely, um, resources are being redirected towards it. I think that's just so critical. To, to say and to be able to communicate. And just to Councillor Knack's earlier point, I, I think it would be very um, helpful and valuable to um, communicate that very clearly to Edmontonians um, so, so that they can see the responsiveness and, um, and yeah, just, just priority that we are all placing on this. Absolutely. Yeah. And building the agility within our integration is kind of where you see us here collectively for the first time. Um, this will become kind of how these updates are done is in an integrated fashion. And we, as a point of uh, course, we're identifying who our comms lead for transit safety was going to be through our project manager today. Okay, fantastic. That's that's really good to hear. Um, so I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you so much and really appreciate all of your efforts and work on this. And I'll take the chair back. Back to you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Thank you. Um, I have sort of three tranches of questions. The first is around, I was actually quite surprised in the presentation. You know, when you talk about safety outcomes, you say all people are physically safe in transit spaces. And yet, when you look at the measures, the key measures, you had medical incidences under perceptions of safety. And I was thinking medical incidences are probably overdose incidents. And I know even recent deaths, both in in downtown and transit, to me that seems like a safety measure, not a perception of safety measure. Can can I get some clarity on that, Council? You wrestled with uh, the one that we wrestled with the entire time with with that measure and where it's properly placed. It kind of falls within both, and uh, for some people who witness the incident, it can be a perception and a feeling and for others can be a safety issue. So as long as we're recording it and it's captured in one of the pill pillars, that's what's, re that's what's uh, really important to us. And we, as we get better at interpreting the data, we will we'll refine those things. But uh, we did have trouble with that exact one. Yeah, and I, well, my feedback would be that I think it needs to be under the safety pillar. Uh, I think that that, yes, I get what you're saying about like there's perceptions of safety if somebody is overdosing and witnesses those incidences. But when you're looking at that definition of all 
people are safe within transit, medical incidences are, and deaths, quite frankly, there have been a few deaths, let's be honest, are a safety concern for those individuals uh, that are experiencing that. So I would challenge that and I would give that feedback that for me, that would be a, a it sends a, a better message um, in, in, under the safety one. And it's an easier measure because we're measuring the medical incident. We're not measuring how many people witnessed that incident. So I, I think that there is a, a nuance there. The second uh, sort of stream of questions I had is, A, thank you for, for this report and for the work that you've done. One of the things that I was concerned about with the monthly verbal reports is losing some of the information that we were getting in the form of memos, um, specifically around ticketing, not just fare evasion, but ticketing in general. I'd worked really hard and advocated for that being included in the memos, and now we're not getting those memos and it's not being included in these verbal reports. Can that be something that the public um, and council has access to as well? in future reports. Yes, and we've been really trying to understand the ticketing information and, and, and what does it contribute to our understanding of enhancing transit safety. And there's so much context that goes in with each specific one. It's not we're hiding from the statistics. We're trying to understand what they're actually telling us and how it contributes to how we move forward and what resources we look at. So. We're really looking at the measures here to where we go next, not what we did. So we will, we have no problem with providing that information. What's hard is providing all the context that comes along with it. Yeah, but I think if, if the, I have definitely heard from Edmontonians that they are curious about what our ticketing rate is and specifically some of the conversation, you're right in the context space around the disproportionate of, of specifically vulnerable people getting tickets. Um, but I think that, you know, that's something that I'm definitely now rec recognizing I'm missing as a data set that my office was relying on and, and monitoring. So I just wanted to provide that feedback. Point taken. Um, and then lastly, I guess just for one of the things that, again, this is where the numbers come in. I, I wanted to ask a quick question on the Southgate calls for service measure. I thought it was interesting that it went down because it went from 100 to 69 but I feel like that's that tracks with logic because if you have more people in the actual station, there would be less calls to service. So I don't know if that's necessarily like this is where sometimes numbers on their own can be a bit. What are your thoughts on that? Like, yeah, that number dropped, but I'm not surprised being that there's more there was more presence. That you're right. Numbers you can interpret pretty much any way you want it sometimes. But with respect to that, usually when we begin any type of proactive initiative, we see a spike in reporting and or a spike mm. in calls. So actually, we should see that number go above 100 and not below. Okay, that's interesting. Great context. Thank you so much. I'm out of time. Thank you. Councillor Cartmel. Thank you. I actually would like to, well, first of all, thank you for the reports and I appreciate this is a bit of a work in progress and you know we're going to get more data informed and, and evolve here. So that I think that's uh, that's really good. But picking up where Councillor Rutherford uh, left off, uh, I'm interesting that the number of calls went down when you might ordinarily expect a spike. I'm wondering how many of those 69 calls, I, I, my understanding was that the, the um, enhanced presence of resources uh, ends at five o'clock. How many of those 69 incidents are after five o'clock? It's a great point, and I, I don't have that statistic for you. We would have to, I'd have to pull that. But um, another thing that we're really trying to realize by doing these measures is when we're proactively in spaces, TPOs and police and security guards, how long does that perception continue? And that's what that measure will tell us. Like if we were really proactive, say in Southgate for one day, every day for a long time, do we get two extra days out of that? How long yeah. does it carry on? Yeah. So that's something we're really trying to understand. I don't have the exact number for you, but we can, we'll look at that for sure. Well, and that's really hard to measure. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I need to be more articulate with this, but I have a question about, uh, in a related way about um, 
beat patrols in, in stations and on platforms. But just to sort of finish this thought, um, I think that's a point well taken potentially that we're seeing more people ride transit, we're seeing more people ride LRT. Presumably that means there's more people in the Southgate station. We've had more resources in the Southgate station. But all of that kind of stops, uh, uh, and I'm not, we don't have data to measure this necessarily, but all of that kind of stops after rush hour. By 7 o'clock, the station is not busy. Everyone's gotten home. The resources have left the station. Is that when these incidents start to pick up and start to happen? And I we will provide, we'll provide that next time. Yeah. So then we have a number of teams, and, and I'll admit I, I struggle to keep them all straight. Um, but the, the two teams of um, EPS, the two EPS teams, 16 officers total, do they operate like beat cops, uh, beat teams? Are they patrolling the platforms and to what extent? They are. They are completely dedicated proactively to the LRT system. So they're not only on the platforms, they actually ride the train. <clears throat> so when they are connecting between the different LRT stations, they will ride the train to go from station to station. They'll ride the entire line. And they are very much like like beat members do within a very specific geography. Their geography currently is is the LRT line. So they're on the whole. How many teams simultaneously? Does, does it this all depends. Work? So we have seven day a week coverage with yeah. only with only two teams in the shift schedule that we work. Some days it's twenty hour a day coverage because they work ten hour shifts, and we have two teams working a day shift and then an evening shift. And then some days we have only one team working. Sometimes it's a day shift. Sometimes it's an evening shift. So we range from ten to twenty hours a day coverage, seven days a week. So um, with, with the 50 officers, is there, is there a consideration that the 50 officers might result in more beat teams? So more pairs in more places at more times of the week? Is that? There will be. And yeah. can, the, the concept that we're working through internally, and then we'll take it to commission for approval as, yeah. as a plan or a strategy, is that we can't just focus on the LRT, is that we have a really large, treating the transit system like a system. We have really large transit centers where there's a lot of interchange with buses, a lot are in, in proximity to commercial spaces. So the plan that we're, that we have kind of being developed right now in concept is in relation to the system as a whole. We are realizing, you know, a month and a half in that two teams on the LRT knowing that the LRT is going to expand this fall is not enough. That yeah. I would suggest that the LRT footprint from the police will be larger than it currently is, but we have to contemplate with 50 officers citywide. That's why this integrated approach in relation to, as Councillor Paquette had mentioned, kind of the right resource at the right time with the right authorities doing the right things, whether it's an intervention attempt in relation to well-being, where a COT team really needs to lead there, or whether it's a TPO, or whether it's security, or whether it's the police, is building this system-wide, data-driven, evidence-informed, large-scale deployment model, and then we have the right resources in the right places at the right times. Right. I'll come back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Councillor Neck, you had your first round, so I think there is uh, an additional speaker that I cannot see. Um, I believe Councillor Tang is on the list, uh, as well as Councillor Rice. So, Councillor Tang, go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much for this very thorough update. Um, I am very conscious last year the downtown and transit safety plan came about as a, you know, in the wake of the Chinatown killings. I'm wondering if you can talk a bit more about what's happening there. Um, you know, I, I mean, I will say I've uh, been, you know, doing lots of walkabouts and visiting, uh, I see a lot of, but what is really visible to me is the cleanliness. I know that, and I see the Cabo cleanup team uh, doing a lot of cleanup. I've, you know, I've, I've seen the, 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 a, the HSOC headquarter, um, see the sign very visible, but not seeing a whole lot of activity. And I guess I'm just wondering if you can elaborate a bit of what is exactly happening in Chinatown as part of downtown core, what is happening with HSOC, um, uh, I know it was touched on very briefly, but just wanted to hear more. Yeah, with regards to HSOC, the building itself is just a deployment space. They're not meant to spend their time there. They need to be visible, and so that's been the, the uh, absolute priority of those teams to be on the street and interacting with businesses, with community members, with the public. Um, with regards to general um, updates on the status in Chinatown, or maybe I'll pass it over. Yeah, Brett uh, Latchford's online to uh, comment. Brett? 
Uh, yeah, thanks for the question, uh, Councilor Tang. So the uh, situation in Chinatown is, is improving um, daily. Um, the BIA has been very active in, in encouraging their members to clean, clean their own sidewalks, but also in partnering with some of the um, social agencies in the area to do cleaning. Uh, that's complementary and supplemental to what the city's been doing uh, in addition to part of the city core stuff. So um, the cleanliness in Chinatown has gone up a great deal. Um, also, most of the encampments have been, um, they're not gone, they're shrunk and they're, and they're sort of around the corner towards Bissell, but they're, um, they're not as prom in as a prominent location to the businesses as they have been in the past. And I think that's also increasing the local perception. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. Um... I guess one on h talk I, I get that it's deployment, but it's shuttered and it kind of blends in with the rest of the shuttered sto storefronts. And, you know, one of the things that I recall very vividly last year during the debate is around this visibility piece, even, and that's why we wanted to have it in Chinatown. There's a very specific reason. So I, 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 I do want to flag that. And then on the Chinatown side, you know, recently I, you know, there's a lot of reporting and I did see the signs that went up from, the BIA about removal of tents and encampment. And actually it made me wonder where do they go? Because I, I question if it actually is shrunk or they've just been displaced. In fact, is a, you know, I think the, the tent city outside of whole mission is actually grown and there is a huge level of irony there for me. Um, and I, I imagine, you know, I know we talk a lot about encampment and I know there's others who have questions about that but I think that's a huge concern for me. Um, I'm curious about what the ethnographic research that was mentioned in the, in the data, what does that look like? Um, and how much of that is done with folks who are living rough? Councilor Tang, uh, the ethnographic research will be run, it's in partnership with In With Forward, and it will- Is it, it happening now? Just at the start of it, we just put okay. together our MOU. Okay. Uh, the goal of this, I can tell you though, you did ask about the, uh, the people that are in transit spaces for safety and security. This, that will be one of the, the, the focuses is to get their opinion and to get their, uh, their thoughts and their perceptions in those spaces. A lot of times uh, their input is not captured with the traditional survey, so that is, that, that is what we're looking to do. Yeah, because I, I often think about the pathway from someone who's using on the street, from that pathway, are they ready for housing? And we're talking about a lot of recovery communities being built by the province. Are, is anybody even, you know, is there a pathway, is there a clear pathway to, to there, to those kind of resources as well? Um, you know, in a lot of the conversations with the various multidisciplinary teams, I understand there's not enough resource to direct people to, and we're hearing a lot of developments of these kinds of new resource, and I guess that pathway isn't very clear to me, and I was hoping you can just talk a little bit about that. Because so far, I'm hearing a lot of opioid prevention, um, and I'm like, how are, how are we getting this, you know, are they even ready for housing? Are they ready for recovery community, right? In eight seconds, no pressure. <laughs> I'll talk really fast. Uh, this uh, sort of gives me a good launching pad to talk about what we're talking with the multidisciplinary teams and the outreach coordination that's coming to council yeah. shortly. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that and I can come back for that second. I think that might be that. a better spot yeah. to discuss if that's okay. Sure, absolutely, thank, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I just want to see, start to say, and uh, like my entire family take public transit, including, including myself, sometime. Uh, the feedback, or the experience, and also the uh, feedback from my constituents, uh, we do see the positive progress um, as a result of the collaboration. So thank you for that. Um, I do have a few questions. The first question about the capacity, and then I really like the approach we're doing right now and the monthly update. Uh, last month, on May 1st, um, in the community committee meeting, and then we received information regarding uh, we have more police officer and added and into the system to address the 
transit safety and public safety. So uh, if my memory is right, and he's an 18 police officer, right? Be at it. 16. 16. Okay, Correct, thank counselor. you. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. So do you still feel the capacity challenge, or do you think right now at this moment is adequate resources enough and then for us to address the continue uh, the inquiries or concerns regarding the public safety and the transit safety as well? I think right now the capacity from a policing perspective is not, um, I don't think we're at capacity. I don't think we have enough of, uh, of EPS members, not only on transit, but available to pivot to transit. And I think that's what makes the integration with all of the other services and approaches and the pathways very important. And that's why we're building this larger deployment model so that we don't either have to operate in complete silos or then believe that we have to do this task alone. Um, 50 police officers at, at full potency, 50 police officers alone across the entire transit system will not be enough. But in partnership with the TPOs, security officers and COT, I think we will be able to make some really strong inroads in both the security and the safety in the safety realm. But currently the, the resources that we have pivoted onto transit were not in relation to this is how many we think transit needs right now. It was how many we had available in order to pivot away from other crime management duties. So thank you. That is actually a very good point and then for public to be aware of. Um, so my next question about your self skid Southgate approach. So Southgate approach and in the presentation covered Central Park RT station as well. Yes, it did. And, and for the measure results is also including uh, the data and refracted Century Park RT station as well, or just only Southgate RT Only station? Southgate. We only chose the one station to present at council today. Oh, okay. So, but you have the Century Park RT station data as Yes, well. we do. Okay, so I would be interested to see that because I still receive some email and from my constituents because most constituents from South and the Southwest and use Central Park uh, Station. Sure, not a problem. Okay, um, another thing about the, the measures. So I do heard my colleagues uh, challenge some measures, but to me, and this is more like I just want to get a clarification to you. Do you specifically have the target to set up for measures? And because there is a huge difference from tracking progress perspective, the indicators and the measures. Because for any measures, you have to have a target. And the indicators, and you can use any time, any point of progress to look at the progress. So I, I want, uh, have better understanding, do you um, choose measures and indicators and that to refract certain things, or have you ever set up use indicators to measure the progress? Because right now, I don't know your target, but how you measure that. So to me, this the results presented today is mm -hmm. appears more like indicators to indicate what's the progress. You're right, I'm gonna to attempt to answer your question and I hope I get it right here. Uh, we do have measures and the way we look at our measures and our indicators are things that we can actually change and have an impact on that will result in a, in a deflection in the needle towards our outcome. So if, if we can utilize one of our measures and we put it there, if we can have the ability to change it in some way, shape or form, we refer to that as a key measure. Our targets right now are simply to be better than what it was at that time last year. We'll continue to refine those as we get better and we identify better measures. We're not there yet, but we wanna be there. Thank you, my time is up. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, everyone else has had a first round. I do see, is there one additional speaker on the bottom there? Uh, I, think I think we're on to the second round, second? but we're just okay. gonna triple check here. Right, move second round. Second. second. Okay, uh, please vote on a second round. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. We have all the votes. Display the vote. That's carried. 
Uh, Councillor Jans, I think that was. Or does not get it because it's just their item. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, shifting gears slightly um, to encampments and how I'll tie this back to transit. So what I've heard is um, when we go out and clear an encampment, um, those folks are displaced. They have uh, uh, nowhere to go. They can't go to the shelters because many of the shelters are full or, or overflowing or they're banned or whatever. So they go then to transit. Have we done a sort of a, a look at, because uh, we have the dates on where we clear encampments, and if we clear an encampment on a Monday, um, then we see a corresponding increase in disorder on transit on Tuesday or neighborhood crime on Tuesday, or what I've heard from some folks is when they had their, their belongings taken, the encampment cleared, they just say, well, now I need to you know, go garage shopping in the neighborhood and, and find a new tent, find a this. So when we clear an encampment, we see a spike in neighborhood crime. Um, adjacent to or or in the area of the encampment. So I'm just wondering how much is our left hand sort of undermining what our right hand is doing or the relationship between those pieces, if we have any data on that? No, we don't have any data because not that we don't want to know it and that we're bridging the gap between transit and encampments. We know that when summer comes, our encampments will increase and in transit the people will leave. We're, we are working to understand that because we know there is a correlation. However, to have measures with, are we going to be tracking a single person and paying attention to, to where they go? Where do we know that person goes? So if we cleared out an encampment of 25 people, how many people actually go to transit? How many people go into the neighborhood? How many people go to somewhere else? We'd have to follow them the entire time to give you the exact number. But are we trying to find correlations between transit and encampments? Yes, we are. Yeah, it, I, it must be very frustrating sort of, you know, uh, and in this in this situation because we're clearing one area, it goes to another, mm -hmm. another area, then goes to another, et cetera. I, I know uh, sometimes it feels like we're solving one problem, like making transit safer, but then we're pushing people out into other areas and now a neighborhood crime is going up or, or encampment calls are going up. And I suppose the caller is true as well that, or the flip is true that um, if we know in summer people leave transit and go to encampments, I guess as it starts to get colder, we're gonna see everyone coming back to the train as well. To, uh, to respond to your statement, yes. Proactively, we're working to do everything we can by October 1st. So what in is, anticipation of that. And the yeah. second portion of that, when you take a very collaborative report, approach with consistent communication, like we did at Southgate with the Southgate approach, and we include included the mindset and people that were working with Malmo, as well as the, the mall, we didn't see displacement. And we looked for displacement. And I'm not saying there wasn't any, because there would have been some, but we couldn't find it statistically. Not in the localized area? No. So they probably left and went to Belvedere or, or, or St. Your, Albert. Or your, <laughs> yeah. your guess is as good as mine, yeah. but we did not see direct displacement in either location. Yeah. I, think, I think one of the things that really worked at the Southgate side, which we haven't talked about here, is the role of private sector partners. Like We had a problem at Southgate Mall where the mall was tossing people out of the mall onto the train. The train was then tossing people off the train into the mall, and then everybody was sort of tossing into the neighborhood and back and forth and back and forth. But I, I commend the Southgate approach because it got everybody in the same room and said, okay, mm -hmm. what's our plan here? Um, but I do worry at the end of the day that we're still moving everyone around. And I guess when we're talking about getting ready for October or we're talking about getting ready for the winter, um, what can we do at this table as councillors? Like, what should we be advocating for to stop this from moving one to the other, one to the other? What, like, what would, what would help keep members safe and, and keep everyone um, safe on transit? Like, is this fundamentally, what's, what's driving this? It's not just one thing. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we know that vulnerable Edmontonians require various services. Some require mental health supports, some require drug addiction supports, some require housing supports. It's not a one size fits all. And I think it's the integration that you're seeing here is a step in the right direction. Um, working with the province, uh, with some of their work on uh, therapeutic communities, like one of the councillors mentioned. And, and, and getting those pathways, getting our outreach coordination tighter and stronger. Um, if I was queen for a day, 
I would like to have more bridge housing. I would like to have more transitional spaces. And so we as administration have been very clear in our requests for more capacity in that space, but also just more capacity in the outreach um, ecosystem, um, more uh, mental health supports, um, more drug addiction supports. So it's, it's a system yeah. response. We can't do it all in what, at once, but we just, we have to get a little bit more. So what it, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, so what's drawing people and to then, transit Do you is, want to come back for oh, another round, Councillor yeah, Sorry. No, no problem. Uh, Councillor Knack. Uh, thanks, Councillor Salvador, and, and maybe I'll pick up from there as well. So excellent coordination happening between groups right here. Uh, we've got support from provincial sheriffs. There is some connection back to the health system. In terms of the data that you are beginning to bring together, how or is that going to be shared with the sheriffs, with AHS, so that we can help work on those pieces? Because I think if they had the data, and, and I'm guessing their sheriffs are collecting data too, that is getting back to the ministries, how does that part work? Do they have access to the same data that we're putting together right now? Can you clarify, Councillor, what you mean by access to the same data we're putting together? So you're putting together, you know, all between EPS and the TPOs and everyone, you're trying to collect data to have a coordinated, um, you know, measurement of targets and outcomes. Um, I imagine you're getting some data from the sheriffs when they're arresting folks or when they're, they're stepping right. in. But likewise, do they, are, are there folks in the province who are getting the data that you'll be putting together? Is there going to be a direct sort of line of sight that says, okay, you've, you've done all this work. This is also going into the hands of decision makers at AHS and decision makers from the Ministry of Public Safety um, that can help see what you're dealing with each and every day. Absolutely. So, so let me chart that journey for you. Sure. With the, with the Sheriff Integration with the EPS right now and the Healthy Streets Operations Center, we are in a one-to-one -one ratio with the sheriffs. Because we are currently under a, a letter of understanding with them, they are not actually seconded employees to the police service, okay. so they don't have access to our records management system. So every event and every occurrence that the sheriffs are involved in, the EPS members document it. We document it in our RMS. What is done in relation to all of the activity and all the occurrences is the sheriff's branch elevates the activity. On a weekly basis, they report to the deputy minister's office on what the sheriffs were involved in that week, which includes how many uh, transportations to shelter, how many interactions with outreach. There are a lot on the law enforcement and the, you know, the, the true, how many arrests and how many you know, officer contact reports and, and tickets and all that is also captured. Uh, but a lot of the qualitative stuff in relation to some, some of the stories that are being told about the integration are elevated weekly to the deputy minister's office if we do formalize an agreement in relation to what that looks like moving forward, um, they are still in place currently. Uh, cabinet election and everything going on in relation to the province, we're waiting to see if the, if the sheriffs are going to stay integrated with our teams. Then we would be looking more towards formalizing them as seconded employees, okay. which allows them access to our records management system. And we, we do parse out their individual activity as well as the joint activity. But currently, everything that occurs, the EPS members document it. And, and what I heard is that they're doing weekly reports to the minister. Or, they are. Or they are. Prior, prior, prior election, I'm sure that's going to continue as, as part of this. Correct, sir. The information they're sharing is just from their interactions as part of the, the team that you have. It's not part of, say, the COT team where you might not have a provincial sheriff. So are they getting that type of data as well as part of the, do we know if they're, they're providing that or if they have access to that as part of the weekly reports being sent to the province? So they have access to the interactions that the sheriffs have done. And this okay. report is actually was curated from the minister's office to, okay. to us and to the sheriff's branch in relation to this is what they're looking for. Okay. So they are looking for some of the typical law enforcement uh, yeah. data, but they're also looking for a lot of this, how many times was someone transported not to the justice system, but into the wellness system. Great. How many times are the sheriffs involved in that? Because That's that becomes great. a very important part of the multidisciplinary yeah, work. But that care. is elevated within the Ministry of Public Safety. Um, I guess the, uh, my expectation would be that the deputy minister or the minister would be then relaying that across to the health system okay. and across to the justice system. Appreciate that. Thank You're you. Welcome. Um, in the presentation, Simon, you mentioned the closure of uh, two West End shelter locations. Essentially, we've lost 250 spaces. Um, 
we, we have virtually nothing now in the West End outside of the very limited mustard seed piece, which is open for a few hours and can fit a handful of people. Do we have, uh, this goes a little bit to maybe some of these other questions, are we seeing, especially in the last two weeks, any data that is showing, you know, or is there an impact at the Jasper Place Transit Center? Because I have, you know, anecdotal experiences about what I'm hearing now in the West End, and I can't give you enough time to respond. So I will come back, just hang on. And that might be um, a question actually for the EPS, because I don't track the, the data for that disorder in that space. I'll come back, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Paquette. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so just quickly, um, how is our approach aligned with learnings in other jurisdictions across Canada? Um, are we paying attention to growing trends and strategies to tackle transit safety in other cities? Because um, clearly this isn't unique to Edmonton issue. You're completely right. And we are currently speaking with Calgary and I think we'll be meeting with them in the next week or two to compare our strategies and how we're moving forward and what it looks like. So yes, we do have e-scans and we are looking into uh, to our closest neighbors as to how we can do business because this is something acro right across Canada that everybody's dealing with. But a lot of people's uh, it's different for a lot of other groups as uh, just the systems are ran differently. And I'll just add, I'm on a national task force with CUDA uh, looking at these issues. And we also participated in their national study with recommendations as well. Yeah, I saw, I saw a report come out at the end of April that was actually a really great brief. Uh, I think it was a seven pager. Okay, so. Um, Councillor Jans talked about uh, displacement, but I'm more curious about proximity. So what is our radius of presence? And the reason I ask that is because in my own ward around Belvedere Station, which was referenced, um, the biggest issue that comes up is folks using uh, drugs around the vicinity of transit stations, about one or two block radius, and uh, the impact on, on businesses and neighbors. To answer your question, I think each station is different. Uh, and why I say that is if we think about Kingsway, you have to walk across the avenue to go from one place to the other. So I'd say that that distance is a little bit bigger. When it comes to Bel Belvedere, the directly impacted areas we, we, we would get close to. Um, maybe I'll turn this over to David Jones as it would be the, the peace officers as well for something to add. So with respect to uh, any type of drug issues, uh, that's not something that the peace officers will deal with in a primary responsibility, only because it falls to uh, the police. Uh, just with respect to the, the Peace Officer Act and the regulations that we have. However, um, if folks are inside transit centers because of the bylaw uh, adjustments uh, or uh, amendments that were made Last year, we do have now some cause to interact with folks who are openly using drugs uh, in, in that bylaw enforcement uh, rather than treating these things in a criminal matter. Okay. All right. So we will see. It's basically the answer, That's, which is fine. That's a legitimate answer. So um, one of the uh, concerns that uh, definitely uh, I'm hearing from from the folks in, in my neighborhoods is that uh, it's been a growing issue for a couple of years. And we've known this has been a growing issue. And, like, and their question is, who's tasked with safety? Whose responsibility is this? Um, and it's pretty difficult to, to respond with, well, you know, council can't direct EPS or, um, you know, training takes time. You know, these are tough ways to answer a question. It sounds to the public like we're passing the buck. And so, what answer do we give them about who is responsible for their safety in public spaces um, when they've already taken their own precautions? I'll try to answer your question first, but I would say that it's everybody's responsibility. Public spaces are also in transit spaces, so there we have TPOs that have authorities that exist. Uh, and it's very important as well for everybody to report crime when it comes to violent crime specifically, definitely that's uh, the police as well in that space. So there's circumstances dependent, but uh, safety 
I feel is everyone's priority and whoever has the authorities uh, in that space to act on them. Yeah, so then the next question I get from the public exactly based on that is, well then why is the problem only growing? Now we're hopefully we're getting metrics to show that it is decreasing, but you can, you can sense the frustration of the public in that uh, they're like, well, if that's your responsibility, what's been going on for the past two years? And, uh, you know, I don't mean to sound harsh. It's just these are the questions we're getting from the public. If I can offer, this is Jennifer, that I know the pandemic feels like it was a thousand years ago, but it's still a fairly recent phenomenon. And us and the rest of the planet are still recovering from what the pandemic uh, did to society and to our public spaces. So not an excuse, but just a, a recognition that uh, the pandemic no one saw coming, nor the impacts that we would be facing and the time it would take to get back to where we were before. Thank you. I'm out of time. Thank you. Councillor Wright, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, and and Ms. Lana, thank you for, for mentioning about the pandemic and where we're at. Because I'm looking at looking at May 2022 to May 23, and you know, for comparison, that's that's correct. But I'm wondering, should we be looking on a sort of an annual basis um, how things have changed, rather than just when I when I did my walk along last week again with the uh, uh, with the transit uh, peace officers. You know, they mentioned that things are seasonal as well. So, you know, is May just a lower month for results compared to November? That, uh, considering that and the seasonality that goes along with uh, our statistics, that's why we kind of compared a May to a May. So it was apples to apples. Uh, we did look at well, what if we compared to the average? So we are working with through that right now. For the data that we had to share with you today, we felt it was better just to compare month to month. Because I'm thinking a better picture. I, last May, um, there wasn't as much activity in the downtown core. Now people are 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 working more downtown, coming to events. Could that be part of the the reason for some of the the drops in some of the stats? Sure. There's, there's Abs absolutely. Okay. It'll also happen to us next year because I anticipate increased ridership for next year and greater safety when we introduce our policing friends and, and have that, that many more people in these spaces. It's going to feel different every single time we come. Okay. So I think our stats will have to continually evolve to capture those things. And, and I do look for input all of the time because it's going to be a learning process. Okay. I'd also add with the Oilers going all the way to the Stanley Cup finals, that will also have a positive impact. <laughs> There's lots of different factors come into play, yeah. Um, and then the other thing that I was um, wondering about with the sheriffs, so my experience with the sheriffs, you know, at the legislature or, you know, maybe doing traffic enforcement out on the, the hen day or whatever, not that I've ever been stopped by them, but. Um, what, working, working on our transit um, with vulnerable, I, I'm sure there's a, a special skill set that's needed. So I'm wondering the sheriffs then that, that were brought in, what sort of training did they receive to be able to, to work in that unit? When the sheriffs were onboarded, we had a four days of training before they became operational, which, which delayed their operationalization by, by a week. And a big part of, of the training that they went through is what it's like to be a public safety actor in this type of environment, in, in the downtown environment, the inner city environment, the transit environment, and what a lot of the uh, compassion, de-escalation, a lot of those things are that are required. And because of where they came from and because of the way that they are trained and their core function in their home agencies was one of the driving reasons why we chose and we still do choose that they are in a one-to-one -one partnership with a EPS member. So the sheriffs are not autonomous in, in the inner city or when they are working on transit or anywhere in the downtown core. <clears throat> they are in the company as a, as a dedicated partner with an EPS member who we have uh, extensive training, not only when they start on the police service, but recurring training, particularly on the teams that they are on in our, in our crime suppression branch around things like compassion fatigue, around things like reconciliation. We continue that training uh, because the position that they're in is considered 
not a truly specialized position, like someone who would work in our organized crime area, but it's certainly more specialized than people who work in, in our patrol function. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good to know then that they sort of had a heads up of, of what they were getting into. Um, and then um, you'd said that the 50, 50 new officers was not going to be enough and it's going to take us about 18 months to get them hired and, and onboarded or whatever. Um, but does that include sort of ramping up for the expansion of the system when the Valley LRT South comes online? It is, and for clarification, Councillor, 50 EPS members alone would not be enough. 104 TPOs alone is not enough. Security alone is not enough. Caught alone is not enough. It's the integration is where I, I see the real magic happening here. Um, the the 18 month plan, uh, the 50 was the number set by the GOA. And I don't know what level of analysis went into how many do you need. Uh, I don't have a line of sight on that. I have a line of sight on 50 are going to be funded on an ongoing basis. So let's create a plan with our police commission in relation to how they're going to be deployed, how we're going to recruit, select, train, how we're going to access them with all of our collective bargaining agreement requirements of where they come from in the organization. And that is an 18 month growth plan, um, which will have to include. So when we do get to the point of, of Davies being open, we have to contemplate that. What does the deployment model look like in relation to a, a, a new station or a new line being opened up? And what does displacement into community look like there? And how are we not only looking at that from a transit perspective, but from a neighborhood policing perspective as well? Okay, so, oh, my time is you're, up. You're okay, time. thank Thanks. you. Uh, Councillor Cartmel. Uh, thank you, so um, perhaps a couple of random sort of jumping around questions. Uh, our ridership numbers, um, um, I think I heard a moment ago 105% of this time last year. Are those ridership numbers focused? Like is there, do we have, um, do we have a lens on that? Is it, is it bus travel is much better and LRT is, is not? Or is it particular parts of the city that have increased ridership numbers and other parts of the city don't? Do we have a... Yeah, so we have an understanding across the different modes. So on the bus side, uh, last week, that was the figure that I was reporting, so 106% of 2019 levels. On the LRT side, we have different um, ways that we're assessing uh, the ridership. It's not using APCs, so it's not quite as sophisticated as on the bus side. We're at about 70% of normal levels is our estimate, and that'll fluctuate uh, and hopefully continue to go up, particularly as we go into the fall. And then on the DAT side, we're getting close to 2019 levels. We're about 89 to 90% of normal, and then we're seeing uh, we've recovered on our weekend trips on DATs. And are we counting actual trips and actual people, or are we inferring that somehow? So it's boarding. So APCs are on about 66 to 67 percent of our bus fleet. So we're really, really confident in those numbers. On the LRT side, we're doing spot checks, we're doing in-person counts, and we're, we have some um, measurement done in terms of the shared trips between bus and LRT, so that's another factor into right. it as well. Right. But the LRT is a bit more inferred and the bus is a bit more counted. And we're working on a plan right now. We want to bring APC units into LRT. So we just have to figure out our um, getting location specific data to talk to an APC unit within the LRT. So that may be a proposal from us in the future. Yeah. Uh, just to really nail down those numbers. Well, and where I was going with that is can we identify uh, places where we're not seeing ridership increase and is there a correlation or an overlap with, uh, with other data sets? Um, so uh, another question then is is sort of the intersection between uh, what Councillor pa Paquette was asking about other jurisdictions and this perception versus reality sort of conversation. And this runs to the anecdotal, so I have another question to follow up. But uh, the question I get is, why don't we do what other cities do? So uh, police on every platform, I asked about that, uh, turnstiles. Uh, I know we've had a conversation about turnstiles before, but I get that question repeatedly about uh, essentially limiting and enforcing access to the transit platforms. Um, are we still investigating that? Are we still exploring that? Yeah, so Calgary actually commissioned a study and brought a report forward and arrived at the same conclusions that we did. So there's just not evidence that they're used as a security tool. We have an open payment system uh, with our proof of payment zones. It's a different model. Um, they're used for fare evasion purposes, not security purposes. 
um, if it's of interest, I'm happy to circulate that Calgary report, um, and we can discuss it from there. Sure, okay. I'd like to see that because I, the feedback I get is the perception is that, and, and I think that there's, a, you know, a potentially confusion between our Pedway system and our transit si or our platform system to be the, to distinguish between the two. But uh, why don't we do what other cities do and, and limit access to the transit platform part of the, that realm? So I'll, I'll leave that there, but again, in this perception versus reality thing. Uh, and on that note, I think I heard Mr. Barkway say that we're going to start asking questions next month about our, our perceptions of our transit system. Did I understand that correctly? Yes, we have questions in the insight survey, and we'll also be going deeper with our thinking. So, in, okay, insight survey. Should we be doing more than that? Like, I'm wondering if there should, if we... Like if we really want to distinguish between perception and reality, should we not really be measuring perceptions in a very, you know, deliberate way? We are structuring an integrated proposal at this time. Uh, it's moving through the approval processes. Okay. Well, I'm not quite sure what that means. Yeah. To build on that, uh, we are going to be introducing our QR code survey. There will be more coming out in the June report about that, but that will supplement the insight survey as well. To, to hit more, and it, what's really neat about that, it'll be time specific, it'll be real time feedback, and it'll be location specific. So it'll be only at first uh, specific number in our pilot project that we're doing with transit, it will be in a specific number of transit facilities uh, during a time, and then we'll be able to measure our, effort, our efforts and how do they actually impact. So if we do A, yeah. how does it feel? Did it actually change things? Like we can look at numbers, but but what did it actually uh, change in the ridership size? So that's uh, that's what's coming. Yeah, approaching real-time feedback and some of the data sets we're talking yes. about. And then that'll be coupled with the ethnographic study as well. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Tang. Great, thank you so much. I understand there's no motion on the table. Um, I'd like to put the motion on the table, if that's okay. Um, for this report, CO01907, to receive for information. Second. And... Uh, um, so I like to, um, uh, Robbie, I like to hear more from, from you and a perspective from Bent Arrow. Um, I'm curious with your well-being indicators, how many of those 600 or so interactions and engagement, um, are, are those unique? How many people are we repeat connections? Um, and are you seeing any of those folks, whether interested or starting to participate with some of the healing services, at Bent Arrow itself. Can you repeat the yeah, first part of the question? No again? problem. Just out of those 600 or so engagement, are those unique interactions? Um, I'd say about half of them are unique. Okay. And then the other half are ongoing. Yeah. And are you finding any of those, or any of those individuals starting to be interested in or accessing, um, particularly for Indigenous community members, are they starting to access Bent Arrow uh, resources? They're accessing a variety of resources throughout the city of Edmonton, so mm -hmm. not specifically to Bent Arrow, um, not that I'm aware of anyway. Um, however, we have recently come into contact with a few, um, I guess, individuals seeking refuge in transit that like are not from the city of Edmonton that we have assisted in getting them back to their homes, their original home spaces um, as they don't want to continue being homeless so they go Absolutely. back to their families. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's, that's good to hear mm -hmm. actually I, and uh, we'll love to hear more stories like that, right? And yep. you know, I heard some testimonials from business owners and whatnot but I think those are also the kinds of um, instances I'm certainly keeping an eye out for in these updates. Um, and I guess I'm also wondering, back to DCM Flamen, um, or I guess, are, are any of those numbers also kind of, because I'm not seeing a clear pathway, and I know we're going to talk about it more next week in some of those specific reports, but how many of those numbers are translating into housing, for example? with some of our permanent supportive housing services. Yeah, we don't have a case management support right. or database that we can track that. Right. Um, and then on, the into, on that integration piece of the 
the data, I get this is very specific to the tripartite, trilateral bodies, right? Um, but, you know, ne next week we're going to be looking at a report from 17 agents, 17 outreach teams, three mutual aids, and that's just part of the whole group. Um, are you going to, you know, in the future, would you consider looking at how are you integrated with some of those pieces? Even just touch on those, not a thorough, you know, but would you be looking at some of those integration as well? Just to give you an example, in my walkabout <coughs> last week with the Yeg ambassadors, right, they're also doing welfare check right around HSOC where there's actually no one, there's no one else around. And I consider that actually pretty, you know, people are there on the ground and I think that's really valuable and I, I hope we get into a bit of that next week. Yeah, we're always wanting to be more coordinated, more collaborative, more integrated. I think it, it, it results in a better impact um, and, and just helps with our effectiveness. Um, and then Superintendent McIntyre, you had mentioned earlier that you're looking at these large scale deployment. And as part of that deployment, I'm assuming you're doing you know, various evidence-based practices like hotspot patrolling and stuff like that. Is that right? That's true. Uh, not only hotspot pr patrolling, but as uh, Mr. Hunter uh, spoke about earlier focused deterrence is a really important thing about not only knowing who some of the most uh, criminalized people who are using these spaces for non-travel purposes but also people who are in these spaces chronically in a well-being space and the approach that <clears throat> kind of cuts across this entire methodology for us is regardless of the behavior so addressing the behavior is the intervention point the disposition does not have to be into the justice system. The disposition can cut across a lot of different pathways. But there are times where the disposition does need to be into the justice system. And that's where I think the police bring the right, the right tools. But we also need to bring the right sensibility and the right temperance in order to contemplate that there are other dispositions that are available. But we are certainly building an acuity-based ge geographic deployment model that is evidence-based in our interventions and is also data-driven in where we are, when we are, and some of the activities that we're doing in relation to that. Good to hear that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Rice. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. So I heard, um, so integrated resources and collaborative efforts is making progress. Uh, however, we still have we still have the gap and between the needs and to address this issue and then the capacity available and we have so for to fill that gap and do you think and is other type of option we can take a look and from uh for example infrastructure perspective like back to the earlier um point uh, counselor catamel point out uh for the turn styles and also from like the the development uh, deploy model and then most important is there any policy change needed so i just want to get a sense and from that how we can fill that gap there one effort to uh fill that counselor will be utilizing the five million dollar grant and we'll be able to propose that uh, show you that information in the future uh, but we took a mindset of being very proactive and thinking upstream so thinking about how do we change the infrastructure as much as we can with that limited amount of money to do that. And, and one thing that we're working on right now is actually uh, making sure that we're able to secure the facility when it's not in operation. And we are working through making sure we have the most appropriate and uh, doors that we can lock and, and that's simple. So we're doing things like that to change the infrastructure because then what we have to do is we have to respond to a mischief or a break and enter, which results in some and a cascade of events after that. Oh, <clears throat> thank you. That, that is actually the key point and the between the secure uh, safety and operation. So I, I do have a follow-up question to administration because last year when council discussed about this model and back to the last year, 2022, I did request to consider about uh, turning styles, mm -hmm. but the feedback I received is um, um, the limited capital funding, that's one. A lot of things is the results and for others to use this and 
may not be really strong enough to reflect how to resolve this problem. So you see the administration is going to reconsider this, do more work, so we can have the more information and regarding and if city could do this, if other city is doing. So we've completed that analysis. Um, so we've done our own research. We've talked with our colleagues. Uh, there's a report out of Calgary. They had commissioned a third party to do a review. So in addition to um, the capital cost and requirement for it, which is going to be high, um, there's just no evidence showing any results from a security perspective. The consensus and the evidence across uh, all of the research, both what Calgary did and what we did, shows that they're used as a fare evasion um, tool and not used as security-based equipment. Okay. Okay, thank you. That uh, I know this is just to repeat <laughs> the answer again. Um, another question is about the Chalatan. I didn't see any updates regarding Chinatown safety and in this reports. And is there any specific reason and not including Chinatown piece in this report? Or we will have the separate report and come back and to demonstrate the progress and how the Chinatown safety is in improvement or not. Happy to include that next time. Okay, it's wonderful. Thank you very much. Then my last question. My last question is related to the next steps. So next steps will last three areas to improve. And for the first one, uh, transit safety, uh, I notice is only like for the hub, is focused on in downtown area, central and the children's station. Uh, however, we have transit safety plus downtown vibrance in the second. To me, that is the overlap. And do we have the plan to actually cover the other LT station instead of only these two stations listed in the report. Bear with me one second. I'm just trying to catch up in my notes as to what you're referring to. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Is la is the the last page okay, for the what's the next? Okay. Oh, okay. And you're saying about the transit facility, the animation programming in Chur in Churchill? Yeah. We're doing several different things. There, there's one coming out at Century Park uh, with respect to animation of the space there. Uh, the Churchill animation is just one of them. We're continually looking okay. into that, uh, work with, with Tom about that all of the time. So. Yeah, we just launched a Downtown Environmentcy Fund in May. We were receiving applications about activating the transit stations and we'll have news to share about projects that we've funded, I'm confident. So we have update. other station covered as well. Uh, it, would, it, it would be, it, yeah, okay. definitely focus. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Tang, can you please take the chair? Still taken. Thank you. Um, Great, so I just actually have a more of a process question, um, just recognizing how, how incredibly important this item is and how much discussion it has generated. Uh, I, I can foresee um, similar amounts of discussion being uh, generated in the future when we get these updates monthly. Uh, and I'm just wondering if there, if there may be any value in um, you know, council receiving some form of, whether it's a presentation, report a few days in advance. Um, I know initially, uh, in the, the motion, it was explicit to provide a verbal update to council. Um, and, and I assume that was because of just, it's a lot of work, there's constraints. Uh, would it be possible to do a slightly <laughs> in advance update for council so that we're not uh, reacting on the spot? Absolutely, and we're finding our rhythm and this is our first shot to get your reaction and your feedback, which we're taking the mad notes on. And we want this to be an effective conversation and so getting that information to you a few days uh, prior is absolutely something we can do. Okay, that would be amazing. Do you need any um, direction on that? Or is that? Received. Good? Okay, excellent, perfect. Uh, that is it from me, so I'll move uh, third round. Second. Please vote. In favor. Thank you, Council Jones. I am a yes. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. And that's passed. Uh, back to you, Councillor Salvador. Thank you. Councillor Jans. Thank you. So I just want to go back to we were like just getting back to the why. So 
why do we have crime on the LRT platform and not at West Edmonton Mall? What I think I heard from admin, or sorry, bad example, we do have crime there, but like, why do we have the acuity of crime at the LRT platform as we do not have at another place? Um, what I think I heard was um, inadequate housing, nowhere to go, uh, issues with mental health and addictions. That's what's that's that's why we keep seeing a fire in the same space. Is that is that a fair summation? And I would also offer it's just when there are more people in a space that also has a an effect on disorder. And when you cite West Edmonton Mall, for example, unlike downtown that closes, you know, when office workers return to their homes, West Edmonton Mall, for example, I think has more people in that space for a longer period of time or a duration over a, over a period of time. So that would be one factor, I right. think. And the city drives this because we, we also, like, when we have hot weather, we push people to the platforms. When we have cold weather, we push people to the platforms. It's, there's no other place for people to go, right? Um, we're not pushing people to the platforms in either situation. Uh, if people are in those spaces, we're not pushing them out of them if it's extreme weather, if that's what you're getting at. But we it's, don't have, like, we don't have an adequate, we have, like, 700 shelter beds for 3,000 unhoused mm -hmm. people. So we acknowledge there's a delta of 2,300 people have nowhere to go. And the library closes, Tim Hortons closes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if I can just um, refine that number, it's when there are 3,000 people on the by names list, that does not mean those all 3,000 are living rough that we're talking around. Like your point is still well made yeah. that there are still more people living rough or sleeping outside than there are uh, emergency shelter beds available. Right. So that part is true. Um, the other element is when we are engaging with folks um, who are um, living rough or in transit spaces, uh, not all are interested in taking us up on, on transit to a shelter bed, for example, because that's what we do during those cold weather months. Yeah, for sure. So, and let's go into the nature of the crime on the platform then. And I realize we're going to get more data about the specific breakdowns. But my understanding is it's not a lot of people stealing sandwiches. It's not a lot of people stealing food. Like, it's it's not people, like, I, I've never had my lunch stolen on the train, right? Like, it's, so it's not a hunger problem. It's um, not a lot of uh, theft, like, laptops and phones and stuff like that that's not I'm not getting correspondence about I had my bag stolen um, I'm getting calls about I saw someone using drugs it's really the nature of the calls seem to be that and then the violence seemed to also from what I can tell from the reports it seems to be people in the drug business doing violence against other people in the drug business for for the most part they're just doing it on the train because that's where they are now I think we're we need to look at the statistics because I think we're generalizing too much because a person can't steal a sandwich on a platform. They'll steal somebody's, they'll steal money, they'll steal what they can steal to pay for that sandwich. Right. So, but we're not seeing, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I'm like, I'm, I'm just going by like what I've read in the correspondence. I'm, I'm not getting people saying I was robbed on the train. And I don't think I've heard from you or the media that we have a major problem with violent stick ups on the train. I can see, say that our EPS data on violent offenses, which robbery is included, has increased. And even when we did our proactive measures at Southgate, it remained the same. It was a bonus. It didn't go up, but yeah. it only remained the same. So things that you brought up are violent criminal offenses, and those are the ones that we need our police partners to assist with and take over, and those are... Those are what you're referring to, right? Yeah, yeah, and I'm trying to get a sense of like of the thousand calls we have, how many of them are those violent ones, and how many of them are just, I, you know, I saw someone doing drugs or dealing drugs or sharing drugs. And please, I have the data, sir. <clears throat> In relation to violence, um, robbery specifically is 10% of the violence that occurs on transit. <clears throat> Assault is 40%. Weapons complaint are 13%. And we have a breakdown in relation to uh, violence and nonviolence is kind of how we care because we roll everything up to crime severity. Uh, but there is certainly, when we talk about uh, robbery, there is certainly a significant amount of calls for service that we respond to it very specifically in relation to robbery. Uh, across, and I'm not talking about, this is across any geospace that it has a transit um, address to it that we capture in our system, which we capture all transit spaces, train and bus in our system as a geospace. Um, and for those percents, where do I divide those against the raw data on slide, slide eight? 
like is there so like um, forty percent of the calls were assaults. So then, do I go to slide eight and look at the raw number of calls was eighty, or is there a different number? No, this is this is this is some data that I brought in relation to uh, what's been occurring. Yeah, and a really really important part of this whole discussion in relation to activity and why we're integrating is two of the biggest silos that we have right now is police data and city data. Yeah. A really big, a really a data model needs to be created in relation to aggregating this data so we have a really great picture across the system as a whole so that we're not over reporting and over criminalizing the transit system or over well being the transit system because we don't have a line of sight on each other's data right now and that's a big part of our integration yeah and Thank and you. I mean I don't know if you need oh darn I'm out of time oh, sorry <laughs> you're way over um thank you okay Councillor Cat, please go ahead oh thank you um so just to follow up on the QR code concept, um, so that is a voluntary um, model. So who do we think will be motivated to actually engage with that? And does that actually give us an appropriate picture of what is going on as far as sentiment? To counteract uh, the point of having one person continually provide negative feedback, we can actually pay attention to IP addresses so we get good feedback that we can rely upon. But that's why we're also coupling this QR point in time study uh, with the insight study and the ethnographic research, simply to try to hit the population from many different avenues, not just the one. We won't rely on one. We will uh, compile everything so we have a better understanding. Yeah, I just think that if I saw that QR code, the only time I would be motivated to use it is if I saw a problem or felt uncomfortable. I'm not going to be uh, enjoying my day and then think, oh, my QR code, I should probably engage with that. It's just not going to happen. So I'm just wondering if we're also going to have in-person people there simply asking, how has your experience been? Or do you have time for a couple questions? You bring up a good point in perhaps in the way that we roll out with communications, is that we are looking for that. We also want to hear about the things that people didn't like so we can pay attention and we can respond to them definitely and we can work on those things. But it, I, I think it's also... It would be great for that. Yeah, and I think it's also very, very important on us all, and this is probably what we can do with the communications aspect, is we have to change uh, the, the communication around transit spaces and the perception by sharing our feedback when we actually have a positive experience and we can probably influence that with our communications around the QR code, which we will try to do. Yeah, okay, and switching gears. I'm assuming that we're going to be measuring uh, enforcement and social service interventions and interactions. And uh, as a result, are we also going to be uh, creating some sort of, sort of uh, data representation of how uh, those two things intersect or overlap. Yes, we will be. And we currently look at the information coming specifically from COT to do that, but we will only get better to answer your question. Yeah, my, my suspicion is that we get a Venn diagram that is almost overlapping circles. Okay, so uh, if it's okay, Madam Chair, I'll just, uh, with my remaining time, speak to the motion. Uh, Councilor Jens, do you have more questions? Oh, it looks like Councilor Jens has Sorry, more questions. Councilor okay. Um, but I'll please put your name on the board out. and we'll, uh, okay. we'll go to speaking too. Would you like to remove a third? Sure, I, I will round. move a fourth round. Fourth. Second. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the vote. It's carried. Go ahead, Councillor Jans. Thank you. I should have said I was going to move a rhetoric-free fourth round, but I missed <laughs> the opportunity. Uh, thank you. I um, 
so this is again this is phenomenal this, i think this is one of the most important conversations we have this year this year and i'm so happy that everyone's at the table and and i don't want to turn this into a a whole like we over and over we've talked about shelters and housing and the need for investments and social supports and the role of the province and all of that that is there but i guess what i'm trying to understand is the the sort of game of thrones winter is coming and absent a change in another 300 daytime bridge housing absent uh, safe consumption sites or a safer place to do drugs uh, and and address addiction absent any major change. Like we're getting, I hear you getting really good at enforcement and responding to incidences and the coordination at Southgate and those other pieces. But I'm also aware like we got 40 stations. We got a lot. Like what what is our plan and how, like what should we be doing to help? You can have some confidence that uh, because of this integration that you're seeing here today, that a lot of our deployments and a lot of our supports that are being um, put into the system are data driven. So we will we'll never have enough resources, like welcome to the public service, but we will deploy the capacity that we have in the most rational way for the greatest impact. Uh, what, what administration needs from our governors, I guess, is just continued support for the work that we're doing and to recognize the complexity within, we work, within which we are working. Uh, patience is a long game and it's a hard game to play because I think we're, we're all tired. We would all like a quicker, better resolution. And I think it's that tenacity and just, I've said this many times, it's incrementalism. It's, are we a little bit better today than we were yesterday? And even coming here for these monthly uh, reports has made us better. It is, it is upped our game. Just the act of this conversation is creating pathways that we maybe didn't have or maybe weren't as strong a couple of months ago. Like given the fact that there are, like if there are no, if, if housing and a lack of housing and all of the social disorder determinants, et cetera, are driving people, when the winter comes, they come to the platform. Do we need to tell Edmontonians, listen, we're going to cut traffic enforcement by 25% in order to shore up um, reinforcements to the, the train? Like what, what's going to, what other options do we have um, absent change? Like I, I guess what I'm trying to understand is like what, you're doing your job, but like what's the plan? What, are, what's, what can we do? Just to add to your point as well, and I think it's carrying on that communication for us. I noticed you'd mentioned that we're getting really good at enforcement. I disagree. We're getting really good at working together. And I'm really pr proud to say that. I'm proud to sit here with my partners and utilize EPS data. I'm, I'm proud to say that we're doing everything we can in the outreach sector. And if we utilize enforcements, we looked at the diversion and, and, and responding appropriately for that person. Carrying on that message would mean so much for us because we're not just going in places and kicking people out and giving them tickets. We're doing the best thing that we can to make our transit safe, our, our, our system safe, but also respecting the people that we're finding in the places. So that's what I would ask for, for assistance. Okay, that's great. Um, I, I, uh, I will speak to it as well, but I'll, I'll leave my question there. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so colleagues, we're now on to speaking to you. Uh, so please add your names to the list if you're interested in doing so. Councillor Paquette, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, to yourself and to uh, my colleagues for your patience uh, with all my questions this morning. I really do deeply appreciate it. And thank you uh, to members of our administration team and EPS who uh, who are really truly working hard and uh, you have faced a lot of tough questions today and a lot of big challenges and this is a frankly one of the largest challenges we face as a city right now in terms of how we operate and uh, public confidence and perception so thank you for that it is a monumental task um, one thing to understand here is that unlimited funds, if we had them in some world, and uh, I, I think it was referenced as if we could be, if someone could be queen for a day, um, I will just say that's not possible that you will always be a queen. So keep going on that. But uh, if we had unlimited funds, uh, we would not get unlimited results simply because there really are legal uh, and governmental jurisdictions at play here. And we have spoken of those things ad nauseum. 
So instead of delving into that yet again, I will simply say that we continue to wait for prudent and sound uh, policy and investment from all orders of government. I believe that uh, that is what is coming from council. I believe that uh, our uh, our public service teams are doing an incredible amount of work. And I think that with this new dashboard, we can demonstrate that work to the public in a way that uh, will inspire that confidence so that the public can see that improvement. Um, we have all been inundated with uh, these concerns and we have all been taking them very seriously for the past two years. And uh, it is only a good thing to see that uh, we are now getting on the same page as far as data, reporting, uh, cooperation with other cities, and uh, what I assume will be reporting back on the results of those meetings. And uh, the work continues. I believe that uh, it was Ju July 4th that was referenced, but uh, that specific date doesn't matter. We will be getting another report next month, and the month after, and the month after, and the inexorable wheel of this work will continue to roll and uh, there are two ways that, that this kind of work can go. One is that people get crushed under that wheel, which I don't think is what's going to happen. I think instead everyone can get on board and uh, we can move forward to something that is more in keeping with the things we want to see and the values that we hold and um, the type of city that we all want to live in. So thank you again so much for your work. And again, thank you to my colleagues for your work and to the public, frankly, for um, you know, keeping this issue at, at top of mind and, uh, and for caring so deeply about their city and for the people who live in it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Uh, Councillor Jantz. Thank you. Um, again, thank you to everyone today for this conversation. Um, a couple points I didn't get a chance to talk on that I'd, I'll just flag for a future report. I really believe we need a specific youth strategy. Um, this is something I hear about where the, um, yeah, I saw a, t a shirt once that said it's not a crime to be a teenager. But I think sometimes people, when they see youth, whether it's the perception that youth have nothing to lose or the youth are um, on the verge of clockwork orange or whatever, there's a fear about youth. And I think we need a bit of a youth strategy here because the what I get from somebody who's like, oh, they're just a, you know, a, a, a sleepy person on the bus versus, oh, I saw a group of teenagers. Like, I think we need a specific youth strategy around um, how, we're, how we're supporting those folks and how we're diverting them. Um, similarly, um, I hate to say this, but there's a huge element of racism here that we haven't even began to talk to. I see it in my emails when people write to me, and for some reason they need to specify the person they're dealing with by race. Doesn't happen, nobody ever says I was cut off by this car, but um, when I get correspondence from people and they need to tell me that the person is indigenous, I'm really perplexed why that is and, and, and how it's necessarily relevant in, in some of these contexts. So I think we really need to think about how we as a city in our anti-racism work, like it is not a crime to be an indigenous person on the train. You cannot call 311 just because you saw an indigenous person on the train. There's a piece here that we need to deal with. And, and I'd like to say all those emails are coming from folks out of town, uh, not here, but the reality is some of them are. Um, I, I really appreciate the points on advocacy that we need to take forward, especially around bridge housing and those pieces. Um, I, I am really pleased with the, the coordination and the, and the sharing and, and all the next steps for data and however council can support that is great. Um, I do worry though, like I, I keep going back to that Chief McPhee quote about we cannot police our way out of crime and that absent any additional supports from, uh, from the government or any moves on our part to build massive bridge housing and shelters, I, I worry that like we are going to be continuing to displace crime like we've seen with Chinatown. We may have had actions on Chinatown and downtown, but I know now like by making that area more air quotes safe, all the rest of our city is now more unsafe. Uh, my calls for service are, are, are through the roof around White Avenue. So we've made downtown safer by not really addressing the crime, but just displacing the crime. And, and that's not on them, they've done their job. It's more, I'm speaking to, to us, what we're, what we're gonna do here. Um, so I'm just worried that collectively, are we, are we truly being smart on crime in our investments and, and what we're doing? So 
Uh, a few of the other pieces, I mean, um, I take Councillor Salvador's request about the data. I would love to know more about um, uh, d data on the on the, the the nature of the crime and and the nature of the incidents. Um, we didn't hear about any overdose deaths, but I know there were a few. We should we should certainly talk about that for future. And um, looking at the cost per response by call, I know 24-7 had some great crisis response data that the uh, cost for the police to respond to a call I think was $2,500, but for 24-7 was only 20 times less at $134. That's not at all to say that we shouldn't have police on the trains. I do support that. I just want to make sure that how can we help the police have more time to do the critical stuff and take the burden off of them? How can we better support our officers through adjacent supports? Um, and also, um, I think that at least for me, it's the first time I heard today that we have sergeants and constables now officially assigned to the train. That's a big win and I hope that's a headline for a lot of my readers uh, uh, or correspondents to my office tomorrow who have been asking for that for a long time. So overall, thank you so much and thank you to my colleagues for indulging all of my curiosities. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, just wanted to, to echo my thanks for all the great work that you're all doing on, on the ground. Um, I'm going to, uh, you know, quote back Superintendent McIntyre. I really appreciated your words that, um, you know, all of us alone, e EPS alone, TPOs alone, COD alone, none of those resources alone can achieve the outcomes we need to achieve. So really appreciate the work that you're doing uh, together to increase that integration and, uh, and deliver great outcomes for all Edmontonians. So thank you and, and look forward to the next update. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tang, would you like to close? Yes, uh, yeah, thank you very much, um, Councillor Salvador, and thank you to all, to all of you. I've been following this conversation around downtown and, and, and tra transit safety with a lot of other cities, whether they're Canadian or American. Um, in our recent uh, Federation of Canadian Municipalities Conference, one of my biggest takeaway is that no city has solved this issue that is almost universal. In, um, and how many of them are actually looking to Edmonton and trying to learn from what we're doing? Um, so what are we doing? And I think in today's presentation, it was pretty evident that we are activating multiple modes of intervention. We are deploying evidence-based you know, patrolling. We are trying, we are coordinating among our outreach, our different sectors and services. Um, and we are making progress. Uh, we're not going to solve the, the, the safety concern here overnight. I think we all know that. But we are making progress stead steadily if we continue to remain steadfast in that um, multiple modes of intervention approach. Um, so I want to thank all the teams who are here uh, and many more who are out there, whether they're doing back-end data monitoring or on the front line. So thank all of you. Um, it doesn't mean we don't have questions or concerns. Um, you know, in I want to echo that point about about youth. In, you know, in my conversations with some of the front lines, such as crisis diversion, I understand that the street population is actually getting younger. That is deeply troubling, um, and and I'm I'm very curious. Which you know, I'm not. Um, uh, I, I didn't get a chance to ask, but I'm, I'm wondering how are we deploying our homeless prevention strategy, which we did fund. And I know oper monthly updates like this is an opportunity to learn, okay, what is the result, what is the outcome, what is the impact of, of all these deployments? Um, I think the, the, the dashboard of data that you presented today was very helpful. Um, and I'll be very interested in some of that eth ethnography work, um, probably not surprising. Um, and also feedback, like the ones we heard earlier, uh, from those who are experiencing um, perhaps complex history or who are who are newer. How you know what are we doing on the prevention side? And it sounds like that work is happening. From um, just listening to Robbie, um, and then the other piece is you know I, I also want to echo this um, you know this conversation around Chinatown. I I've always struggled about separating Chinatown out of downtown core. Um, but I want to kind of, you know, remind the room too about why we had that plan initially. Um, and I don't want um, that conversation to be left out of this discussion. Um, and I will appreciate more, I guess, pro proactive um, share back uh, for the next update. Um, yeah, I, you know, I am, 
I am out there. I'm, I'm talking to many of your teams. Um, I think we have lots of relevant uh, reports coming back next week um, that can help inform this discussion that, you know, this one update is not the end. <laughs> you know, there's so much work that is happening. There's so many more discussions that's happening. Um, work is underway. We're making progress. Uh, and I, you know, I, I hear you. You're taking notes. You're, you're hearing our concerns as well to perhaps inform future updates. And I really, really appreciate that. So thank you. And um, let's, I, anyways, that, 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 that's it. I'll, I will leave it there. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Tang. Uh, please vote to receive your information. You have all the votes. Display the vote. That is carried. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, uh, so our next item is uh, private reports 9.3. Uh, so can I get, uh, and we're, we're almost at lunch, but let's, let's move in private. Uh, so moved. Second. Moved by Councillor Rice, second by Councillor Stevenson. Please vote to go in private and that's subject to sections 17, 23, and 24. Councillor Paquette. Thank you so much. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That's carried. Uh, and we'll just pause briefly uh, as we get the right folks in the room. Thank you so much. Yeah, how long is it? Actually, six minutes? Yeah, you know what? Let's, uh, let's do the presentation. We can get that in before. Okay. If people have to go right at noon, why don't we just come uh, back at 1.30? Okay, so let's, let's break now, everyone. Um, and then <laughs> we'll, we'll return at 1.30 and uh, resume with presentation from administration. Thank you.
that's for Okay, uh, we are back in public uh, and just looking for a wording. So it would just be that the recommendations as outlined in the revised attachment nine be approved and that there the whole go. report stay in private, please. Someone like to move that? So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, any questions, comments before we vote? Seeing none, please vote. That's not coming up, I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. We have 12 votes. Uh, display the vote. That's carried. Okay, uh, which means we are done with that item. Uh, but I do believe we have um, so notices of motion. So hang on here. Motions pending on notices of motion without customary notice. We do have one. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. I'll move that Council waives the rules on providing notice of motion as set out in Section 32 of Bylaw 1811, Council Procedures Bylaw, to allow Councillor. Hamilton to make a motion without customary notice regarding changes to the July 2023 calendar. Seconder. Second. Second. Uh, so please vote to allow Councillor Hamilton to uh, make a motion without customary notice. We have 12 votes. Display the vote. That's carried. Go ahead, Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. I'll move that the orders of the day for the July 4th and 5th, 2023 City Council meeting be changed as follows. July 4th, a dinner break added from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. and a recess at 9 p.m. And July 5th, a continuation dinner from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. with adjournment at 9 p.m. Second. Thank you. Um, Councillor Hamilton, do we need an ex explanation for this one? Just a I uh, maybe from yeah. the clerk. Yeah, so that would this, be great. Sorry, and thank you for the chance to provide some context. So at the last agenda review committee in looking at the forecast for the July 4th, 5th council meeting, it is robust. And so at that point, uh, we were asked if we could look at what options we have either to continue the meeting or to make the meetings longer. Our recommendation based on what we have right now is to have those meetings go from 930 to 9 both days. Great. Thank you for that explanation. Um, any questions, colleagues? Nope. Comments? I assume none. Let's vote. We have 12 votes. Display the vote. That's carried. Thanks so much, everyone. We are adjourned. Good work. And, and excellent chair.